Welcome back, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to hand it over to Chair Williams, who will introduce the next se session. Thanks, Barb. Every year, the PCOB prepares a strategic plan with a five-year outlook, and the purpose of the strategic plan is to communicate how the PCOB will focus its attention and resources for the next five years, providing transparency to our stakeholders. Shortly after the new board was constituted, we began evaluating our organization and our future direction and fulfilling our mission to protect the interests of investors and further the public interest in the preparation of informative, accurate, and independent audit reports. And to assist with this evaluation and development of our strategic plan, we engaged the consulting firm of Bernuth and Williamson. As we develop the strategic plan, we believe it's really imperative that we consider the perspectives of our various stakeholders, including PCOB staff, investors, investor advocates, financial statement preparers, audit committee members, other regulators, academics, and the entities we regulate. And as members of our Standards and Emerging Issues Advisory Group, collectively, you represent many of these important stakeholders, and we want to hear from you. Therefore, we thought it'd be appropriate to take some time today to obtain your perspectives on the PCAOB and the auditing profession as we set our future path in executing our mission. So we connect, conducted a, a similar session during last week's investor advisory group meeting. And I and my fellow board members found it to be very insightful. And I'm sure today's discussion will be equally informative. Um, we are gonna be presenting a slide and it contains questions that we provided to you in advance. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we did that so we could be prepared for the discussion. Charles Moore from BNW will facilitate this session so that I and my fellow board members can be actively present in the discussion. And his colleague Berkeley Dar is also going to be with us today. So Charles, I hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Erica. Uh, and Yes, I am facilitating, but uh, the idea is that I will uh, not speak that much uh, and hopefully just help the conversation uh, keep moving along in a productive direction. Uh, maybe the other thing to note is uh, obviously we're doing this in the context of uh, doing the strategic plan, but obviously it's not the only time uh, that you all will be contributing to the go forward strategy of the organization. Uh, and so uh, this should feel like uh, one of uh, uh, many similar conversations uh, that will help inform the direction of the organization. Uh, and then finally, again, I'll, I'll try to make sure uh, everyone um, is recognized and can speak, but the right. idea here is to have a conversation um, and, as opposed to just you know going one by one and sharing. And so um, to the extent to which you all want to um, add on or ask questions of each other or uh, you know, it, we can keep it lively and keep it moving. So, um, all of that is welcome. Um, I'll maybe start with the, the 1st question to kick us off. And then again, we'll let the conversation, uh, go where it will. Uh, but it'd be great to hear you all's perspective on, uh, what are the most promising opportunities, um, for the PCAOB, um, to, uh, best protect the interest of investors. John, I see you have your hand raised. Well, I was waiting for someone else to go first, but uh, I, I will go ahead and start on the uh, the subject of climate and one of the thing one one of the current issues that that I at least am mulling over. And Lynn, I we'll, we'll, since we want a conversation, I would love to hear your your thoughts on it. Um, so, just generally on whether the you know. What involvement the PCOB should have uh, with respect to ESG and, and climate in particular. Um, if we look at the SEC proposal that came out in March, one part of it is about an att attestation of greenhouse gas emissions, um, and that being you can do that without uh, involvement of uh, CPAs. Actually, the way it's set up, um, I wasn't going to particularly comment on that, although I do think it's the when we talk about the attestation standard and the updating of it, that certainly is a, 
a topic in this space. What I was more focused on was the new requirement um, to have a financial statement note or footnote, I guess note, I guess you call it, uh, covering climate matters. Um, and that is, okay, let's just say, an all new space for the PCOB. It's, it frankly is an all new space for financial statements. Um, but th this proposal uh, really sets up a very comprehensive, robust uh, set of disclosures uh, in the in the climate space um, with respect both to uh, weather events and uh, and transition activities. And the I guess the issue, particularly with me, is is that the way the the proposal is set up. Uh, the comment period closes this week, um, and there's a lot of timing set up in the proposal, but it's supposed to, it's set up at least that it's going to go final this year. And so this requirement to include a very comprehensive uh, note to audited financials for large companies uh, is going to go into effect next year, uh, you know, beginning in 2023. Um, and that those it will be audited and it will be subject to ICFR. Um, and there are, as proposed at least, a lot of new categories of information there that are going to require the kinds of estimates that I don't think uh, preparers have made in the past or that auditors have audited in the past. It's going to require uh, really substantial policy decisions, company by company, uh, that you know haven't haven't been set up to be done so far. Um, and as I say, it, it, this this is going to go as set up at least is, is set up to go effective January one. Um, e even if it ended up not going effective for a year later, I don't think my timing comments are frankly any different. Um, I feel like this is something that belongs on the on the top of the PCOB's agenda. I mean, Lynn and I lived through watching AS2 get adopted and then morph into AS5, and the number of years it took to figure out the kind of auditing standard you needed for something that was, in effect, brand new. And this this is all brand new, and if you need to have, I think you need to have an auditing standard. And I'm going to say as early as the beginning of next year. So I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, or even if it's a year later, I, it just strikes me as something that uh, merits a substantial amount of discussion of how the PCLB is going to approach that topic. And it, and it is, you know, a new area vis-a-vis -vis investors. But I'll, I'll pause there, and uh, Lynn, I, I, I knew I'd want to call on you. Thanks, John. And and again, uh, I see several people have their hands raised, but I mean, again, the encouragement is to add on to that, you know, ask a question, spark conversation, um, so that we don't just have to go uh, sequentially here. Um, but uh, John uh, Lukomnik, if I got the pronunciation right, I think you were next. And John, we can't hear you. I think John's comments um, are valid, but they're also um, we're in a space which is both premature and not enough time. Is I think what he's saying it's premature because the the rules clearly are not final or adopted. Um, but if they are adopted, there may not be enough time. I, I would like to follow up on, on my question to George earlier and more generally. Um, about other information there under current auditing standards there is a responsibility for auditors to read and consider other information as far as i know that standard i'll just express my opinion the investors tend to get a lot of information that's what markets move on we ask 
companies to provide a lot of information. We could argue whether we ask for the right information, too much, too little, but we do ask for a lot of information and they provide a lot of information. The problem is that it sometimes does not conform to what is in the financial statements. So since we're talking about climate, I can think of situations where companies have used different discount rates, different prices of carbon um, in their sustainability report and in their financial statements. Um, so far as I know, there was no CAM proposed or um, given to say how the auditor had considered the other information and decided that this discrepancy um, was resolved. Um, I have seen tons of companies that have made statements about uh, net zero pledges or even more explicit pledges, and yet their carbon intensive fixed assets are considered to have periods of probable usefulness extending to 2080. And again, no reconciliation, no CAM. Um, and, and the reason that I suggest the read and consider is because it is a very flexible market mechanism that can be used as certain types of information, including non-GAAP um, metrics are put out there for the auditor to have to see how it ties to the financial statement. Um, and so I think that is an, a promising opportunity um, to use the phrase of your question um, for the PCOB to look at, to provide um, guidance or focus, to look at um, in, in, as this moves forward even um, before looking at the new disclosure regs from the SEC since they haven't yet been adopted. Thank you. Great, thank you, John. I think Steve was up next. Good afternoon slash good morning, everyone. So in, in terms of, I, I agree that the PCOB, I'll just to build on the prior comments that were made, this should be something that should be on the radar at the same time, there's a lot that is going on in terms of, of audit quality needs, if you will, from let's call it the, the non ESG portion of this. And we all know there's an election in November. There's a lot. What ESG is now could be very different from what ESG is, is in a year or a few years. But I do agree it is something that needs to be on the radar and probably some steps need to be taken to so that when this becomes more, it, whether the rules are finalized, whatever ESG becomes that the PPCOB is ready. My overall, in terms of promising opportunities uh, and in terms of the, the PCOB overall, I think we're all old enough to have just started our careers when there was one set of auditing standards. And, and now we have, when PCOB came into existence, it chose to create its own set of auditing standards and it started with US gas as it was in 2004 and has made a number of changes since then. US gas has evolved. IAASB has, in, has increased in its prominence uh, due to its wider acceptance and then also due to the, the changes in capital markets. If you think about it, there's more ways to, that companies can, can do offerings. There's uh, companies that are outside the scope of the big four typical client, but that are more in my space that suddenly have offshore subsidiaries or themselves subsidiaries. And there's I'm finding ourselves more and more in this situation where we're having to deal with two or three different sets of auditing standards on the same, maybe the same financial reporting framework. So my, my encouragement for thought here is that I, I realize the PCOB's mandate and so forth, but the PCOB, these are deepest capital markets in the world, and we, we the rest of the world tends to look at us a, as a country. And I think that to basically take a step back and say, what can be done in terms of convergence, harmonizing, and so forth in, in term, whether whoever speaks first, whether it's PCOB, AICPA, IAWSB, I understand there's a lot of dynamic that's there, but at the end of the day, I look at myself and I grew up in a large regional firm that didn't have a distinct national office function and how much time we would spend auditing the same number, the same disclosure, whatever it is, 
but having to spend time on the nuances between what PCOB is and what AICPA is, and that there are not necessarily dedicated teams that spend their whole lives on PCOB and so forth. So the idea being is, is that to say that obviously if something is a better way of doing something and it's in the public interest, I'm all for it, but are there are there needs for differences? Are there needs for the level of differences that exist currently between PCOB, AICPA, and ODSSB? Because a lot of the, whether a firm has a national office or doesn't, somebody is spending time on this or should be spending time on this, and it's driving inconsistencies and striving inspection findings, and it's distracting from the effort of audit teams unintentionally, I believe, from saying, hey, is this inventory here? Does this exist? Are these financial statements fairly stated? As opposed to going through a lot of the nuances that there are of the differences between there. So my, and I realize it's slightly different from probably what you were expecting from this question, but I think the PCOB is in a very unique position to kind of help drive the consistency in, in whether it's in terms of accepting concepts from other standard setters or in just having heavier interaction with standard setters so that auditors like myself could sing from the same seat of music, if you will, in terms of a, a common framework to kind of address these things uh, in looking at those risks and material misstatements and so forth, as opposed to being caught up on the nuances of documentation and, and the, the nuances between the standards. So. That was what I had. Charles, Great, if thanks, I could Steve. jump in. Yes, please, Erica. So Lynn put into um, the chat a request that I uh, provide some information to the extent possible, um, keeping, in, keeping in mind um, our ethics rules, uh, what the PCOB is doing in the climate space. And so one of the things that we are doing is that we're closely following what the SEC is doing with respect to their proposal. And I know that their comment period is closing soon, and we all know that proposals um, sometimes and often do change between proposal and adoption. So we are keeping a close eye on this and the impacts on the auditing space. Um, as John noted, the proposal does include some changes to disclosures in SX, um, and which they are subject to auditing requirements and a separate attestation requirement for other disclosures, um, which will allow for PCOB attestation or other attestation. Um, and so we're continuing to monitoring this and assess whether or not our standards are fit for purpose. And our agenda is dynamic. I think Christina mentioned that earlier today, and it is on our website. And so if we evaluate that there's anything that we do need to do to take into consideration the SEC's eventual adoption, um, or where they are seem to be going with respect to climate, then we can and, and would make that change. And so I just wanted to let everyone know that we are monitoring and, and, and we will see where the SEC goes with this. Great, thank you. Uh, Christine, see if you're in race, yes. Uh, yes, I'm happy to, I think Ron was before me, but should I go first? I just wanted to be fair, Ron. Oh, I think go you ahead, raised your hand. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> okay, all right, sorry. So I wanted to comment maybe on a couple of the questions and they all a crossover. So there was a question about opportunities, there was a question about challenges and then trends in auditing. And it piggybacks off of what some of the others are saying, which is really about the pace of change. Uh, and disruption. So John talked about that with ESG. Steve, in general, you talked about the many changes uh, that were facing. John uh, talked about it also with other information. And I think when we think of disruption and rapid changes in technology, and that affects the markets, that affects us as auditors, and, and certainly as preparers, is that it's a great opportunity actually for the PCOB to be focused on the future and the risks that all this pace of change brings and the opportunities and a great opportunity, of course, for this committee to help identify those emerging issues and, and work with the, the PCOB on those emerging issues. And in addition to what we've talked about, ESG and, and standard setting and digitization, I think talent is part of this disruption and pace of change where there's expanded needs for diverse talent 
There's shortages in the profession. Clearly, George even talked about that from the PCOB's perspective and uh, issues attracting uh, qualified talent. And it's certainly issues getting diverse talent too into the profession. So those are just some of the issues that I think could be important for the PCOB to focus on. Great, thank you. And Ron. Great. Well, th thank you very much, Charles. And I, I want to add on to uh, to John White's comments. I mean, I do think that uh, you know a day doesn't go by that that myself and many of those around me at, at at my company aren't focused on ESG and and all the changes. And you know, I think Christine talked about the pace of change. And in that space, it's it's tremendous. And I think what the SCC is proposing is a, a tremendous change as well. Um, and you know, I know in a way we're kind of in a a dilemma, a catch-22, that there's nothing final from them, so it's hard to to do things, and I, I get that. But I think the, you know, the 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 need to do something extremely rapid, you know, assuming that it is uh, approved at some level, is is pretty critical. And I think not just, you know, I think you know, you all will think naturally about the audit firms, and that's understandable. But I mean, there's a trickle-down effect that hits the preparers very directly, and I just, you know, and, and we're working hard, you know. In anticipation of the SEC's rule adoption, uh, you know, and we don't know what that final is going to be, but we're working hard to make sure we close any gaps that we have. And uh, it'll probably be something different that's proposed, but there'll be something changing for sure. Um, and I, I guess I want to try to reinforce that to the extent that, you know, things come in later, new, new, you know, PCOB rules, auditing standards, whatever those things have an impact on preparers as well. It's not just the audit firms that have to react. We have to react because they're reacting to those standards. So, you know, just encouraging that, uh, you know, I think this is something that's, you know, top of mind for me, and I think it should be top of mind at the PCOB as well. Thanks, Diane. Uh, yes, I wanted to follow, um, follow along with um, Steve's thoughts on, on problems with consistency because or the lack of consistency, which is always of concern to investors and your your question about the promising opportunities and how it relates to the strategic plan for the next number of years. And I, I'm thinking that it's um, should be part of anyone's strategic plan to continue to maintain your strong relationships with other organizations that have complementary missions of investor protection or consumer protection and that undertake analyses to um, see if there is a lack of consistency in financial reporting, a lack of consistency in implementation. So I'm thinking about um, post-implementation reviews that the FASB does where they uh, they have extensive outreach to stakeholder communities, investor communities, preparer communities, and and look at uh, problems with implementation. And um, the same goes for licensing boards where they hear complaints from consumers about um, how how audits are not being done properly. And so you can get very good feedback and and the same goes internationally. you can get, uh, um, excellent feedback as well. So just from a strategic standpoint to continue maintaining and even strengthening the, the relationships with other regulatory and um, standard setting bodies that have complementary missions to the PCAOB. Thanks, Diane. And I think Dane was up next. Thanks, Charles. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll speak as you know someone from the investment community. Uh, you know, if we're talking about protecting in, uh, investors and their needs, you know, the biggest thing that an investor wants out of uh, the audit profession is ultimately to identify frauds and to to find those accounting issues. And then one one issue that I have as an investor is, you know, I can think back over my career and I can't really think of a major fraud um, that was actually identified by the auditors. Um, a lot of them have come through other means, whether it be tips or um, other 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 things. So, um, you know, if, if we want to restore confidence with investors, that's the first thing. You know, we need to have the confidence that um, that that the profession is actually finding fee issues, um, and I think that speaks to transparency. Perhaps 
um, these issues are being identified, but um, you know, partially probably from the regulation with which the PCAOB was set up, they don't have as much opportunity or you don't have as much opportunity for transparency as um, other organizations like the SEC. Um, you know, a lot of things just can't be talked about um, in terms of what your findings are and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, I might start holistically by saying, you know, one, how can we be more transparent? You know, you ultimately have to work within the, the limits of your um, the regulations, but, you know, perhaps it's kind of a compare and contrast versus what's available to you versus the SEC, where you can be transparent, where you're limited by statutes or, or um, to, to, to not have um, transparency, like for example, FOIA requests. You can do a FOIA request of other agencies, you can't do it um, for um, the PCAOB. We talked earlier about um, whistleblowers, you know, the SEC has a whistleblower program and traditionally most frauds have been found by whistleblower, um, you know, that that's been one of the biggest areas of finding problems. Um, so, you know, again, just kind of looking at where structurally there are weaknesses in the system and saying, okay, let's identify these weaknesses and then figure out if there's actually an opportunity to correct them either versus, you know, via what the PCOB has available to itself, um, or maybe others will have to intervene such as Congress or so on and so forth to, to make those things available. And then lastly, I think it's also just to make a concerted effort to have direct communication with investors. Um, we see with other organizations like the, the FASB and so forth, and so forth the ISB, you know, they have an investor liaison. Um, investors and accountants think differently. I'm a CPA and I'm an investor. And like I say, I see my role as kind of a translator. They don't really speak the same language. Um, so to really connect with investors, um, it's gonna take a concerted, dedicated effort that's really crafting um, communication to really reach them and engage with them. Thanks, Dane. And I've got the the list of people, the order in which they raise their hands. But if you all have, you know, a burning comment that's in response to someone else's point, like feel free to interject um, so we can have a, a conversation. Uh, so I just want to make sure everyone's getting in there uh, at the right time. Uh, and I think, with that said, Jeff was next in the queue. Thank you. Uh First, I'm, I'd second everything that uh, Dane just said. I agree with him on all those points. Uh, going back to John and Ron's comments on uh, climate, I mean, I, I, I agree with you, John. I mean, the extent they finalize a rule that includes this SX footnote, as well as the other attestation requirements for the emission disclosures, then it makes sense that there might need to be some standard or guidance from the PCOB. We, in CII's letter, we suggested that there be a deferral of uh, the initial implementation dates in response to your concerns, John. Um, I would just throw out that, John, perhaps for a, a, a near-term or a stopgap measure that may perhaps the OCA staff could put out guidance while a standard was going through the due process uh, at the PCOB. So potentially that would be a, a way to address the, the timing difficulties that, that you raised. Uh, with respect to promising opportunities, I, I, I would just point to the one uh, standard and I think has uh, some promise um, respect to uh, protecting the interests of investors and that's the quality control standards. And the, I mentioned that for two reasons, one, just a practical reason that you've already issued uh, a, a document for for comment uh, on that project, so there's already been some good work done. And uh, second, I think it can be a really important standard, um, particularly if it incorporates uh, some of the recommendations from the Treasury Advisory Committee on the Auditing Profession, uh, which have not yet been fully adopted, including issues related to firm governance and reporting, as well as we talked about earlier, uh, audit quality indicators. So I, I point to that standard setting project as uh, one that presents a promising opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. And Brian, you're up next. 
Great, thanks. And maybe just starting overall on the strategic plan and a number of people have mentioned the degree of change that we're seeing again back to earlier comments I made and, and many folks have mentioned on um, whether it be macroeconomic, geopolitical data and technology, the great resignation. And, 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 and now we're talking about climate and change and disclosure. Um, I, I think all of that is important to be keeping in mind. As as you're um, in developing your, not only your strategic plan, but then refining your, your uh, standard setting agenda. Um, that said, I do think the existing strategic plan that is the starting point is very well grounded and its underpinnings are, are, are well grounded in, um, you know, the board's mission and mandate. I, I think obviously, it, um, you know, what's important is how one executes on what's in a strategic plan. But I, I, I think there's a lot of good content to start from relative to the existing plan and a lot of important goals and objectives upon which there was um, some fairly significant progress, but but certainly certainly more 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 things to be done. Um, you know, some of the comments I made earlier on inspections and at least my observations um, relative to the you know, sort of the, the thoughtful and nimble approach that um, that's been taken in a um, you know in a time of tremendous change and the degree of transparency relative to um, um, kind of the, the results of inspections in a timely manner. Um, are really in, important when there's that much change going on. And I think, you know, making sure that that's incorporated in, in, in kind of the, the thinking. From a standards perspective, and, and maybe we'll get to this more when we talk about the standard setting agenda, I do wonder if it would be helpful to have a bit more of a framework that's public um, relative to um, how one thinks about when something gets put on the standard setting agenda or which policy initiatives are advanced and 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 what problems are attempted to be um, we're, we're attempting to solve in such that um, it may help um, with the types of public input that you're able to get and the specificity of public input that you'll you'll be able to get um, as well as helping with prioritization if there's a better understanding. So, for example, I know in the IAG meeting some were questioning, well, geez, is this on your agenda because you know it's you're really just making some some refinements or 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 is this really you know, broader, broader change um, relative to the overall objectives. And that may make a difference in terms of people's views and perspectives as to what's more important or less um, as well as, as I would think it would for the board and staff alike. And so, I, you know, I, I, I think, and, and maybe, maybe there's an internal one, which, which, which is fine, but maybe more discussion around that in, in a strategic plan and more discussion around that for this group, I think could be, could be useful to, um, to then Having plans up front relative to, um, you know, what problems are being solved in the objectives and 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 and, and a better, um, you know, kind of a grounding point for the entirety of, of of a project. As it relates to ESG, I just wanted to suggest that, and I, I I take the the comments that were made about the importance of the learnings from kind of the AS2 AS5 kind of time frame that John brought up, and I, I think a great example of the SEC and PCB working together was. Around the broker dealer rulemaking, where the attestation standards AT1 and 2 were developed alongside of the amendments to 17A5. And, you know, here maybe there's some opportunity for that recognizing. I presume there's a ways to go in the SEC rulemaking. Certainly, our comment letter would suggest um, that we'll be filing will suggest that, that additional time be provided uh, for implementation. And, and, um, and given the complexity of the rule, the proposed rule, I would expect, I would suspect, like our comment letter, there'll be a lot for the SEC to think about. So I suspect there's a good amount of time to continue to work together. But to John's point, I think that time will go by quickly. And um, and and so, uh, you know, I, I think looking back to how that was done relative to AT one and two, um, in in terms of working together, would 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 be useful. Um, so I, I, th I think those are, and again, I'll have some other comments maybe around around the standards setting agenda, but as it relates to the plan, that that's um, that's kind of what I wanted to offer. Thanks, Brian. Jennifer. Hi, um, I think 1 of the things that I, I keep thinking about as I hear the comments with respect to ESGs is more. Um, investors have a broader concern that they want some more information about risks, whether it be ESGs or broader, you know, cams. And in the US, it seems that auditors are less forthcoming and less informative um, about what they're observing at the client. Um, and perhaps the PCOB could consider 
motivating some stronger collaboration between auditors and audit committees and providing this more detailed risk disclosure that investors are seeking. Um, I think academic research is showing that given management incentives to be self-serving, a lot of the you know, ESG disclosures are not necessarily the most informative and there's definitely been documentation of greenwashing um, in the literature by, by many corporations or similar to setting up special purpose entities that companies are setting up special entities to, um, to, to, to locate all of their negative environmental impact. And so, you know, I think working to ensure that there's stronger audit committees working with more um, information from auditors could be a way that, that investors could get that information. I think we, we uh, uh, my co-authors and I did a study where we found that stronger audit committees and more informative audit disclosures actually motivated the managers to self-disclose, right? So it's voluntary disclosure and we don't, in, in that way we can get a more cooperative approach um, towards disclosures. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and I think it's Keisha and apologies if I didn't get the pronunciation correct. No worries. Absolutely correct in the pronunciation. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to share, but I want to go back to the talent discussion. I started a little bit earlier, um, but in this environment of rapid change, uh, talent is still uh, an issue. Uh, we heard earlier, especially from the largest division uh, within the organization about the challenges with talent. So my views on talent are going to be internal and external uh, that the organization really needs to think about um, internally. Uh, how they are keeping, retaining, developing. I think there were some other comments in the chat as well, because we're seeing this overall. Uh, we can roll all the way back to 2008, where there was an advisory commission, uh, a committee on the auditing profession, had great conversation. That document is very robust, um, but we really haven't operationalized as much as we can in terms of understanding the human capital aspects. So from an internal perspective, what is the go for strategy in terms of development, uh, making sure people have opportunities. I mean, even when we come and talk about compensation, those are things internally and then externally. I think when we're thinking about the organization uh, in terms of opportunities, uh, we have seen a significant change in the audit profession around disclosures in terms of human capital, transparency reports, recruiting, especially diverse hiring and things of that nature. Well, is this really tone at the top or to kind of what Jennifer was talking about is some ESG measures, greenwashing? Are we just seeing a lot of commercial discussion and not really impactful change? So I think this may be an opportunity uh, for the regulator to really understand the tone at the top when we're doing those QC evaluations around human capital issues, around hiring, um, because we've talked about talent being a challenge in this profession for a while. I think this is an opportunity now that the firms are being more forthcoming. There are documents out there that uh, can be evaluated from a tone of the top perspective to really see if we're going to have meaningful change in this area because we're going to need everybody that should be in the profession in the profession in order to address these rapid changes that we're seeing in our environment. So I just want to make sure that the organization is thinking of talent internally and externally as well. Great, thank you. And, and in some ways, that's sort of a bridge to the second question that I'll throw to the group. Um, and that's, you know, as we have been discussing the plan, uh, it has had the uh, sound of, well, what's most important today? And then how do you prepare the organization to respond to all the things that are going to happen tomorrow and next week and next year uh, and going forward? And so the the, sec the question related to that is, uh, what are the trends that you all are seeing affecting the audit profession that the PCAOB should be having in its mind as it um, approaches its plan? Um, so I'll put that out to the group. Um, Susan, you are up next in the queue. And then Preeti, I saw you put a couple of uh, comments in the chat. Um, so please feel free to jump in if you wanted to uh, expand on any of those thoughts. So. 
first of all, I agree with what everyone's saying. I think we're really definitely on the same um, track here with what are some of the most important issues. I think we could probably dig in further to controls, whether that be controls generally around data or, you know, more specifically um, where the data comes from, how we, how trustworthy is it? I am, that's a huge issue for investors when we're talking about, um, you know, transparency and overall trust in the financial reporting. So there's a few things I wanted to bring up with regard to that. Um, there are a lot of trends that I think are going to become um, very important, and we should be very aware of them. Um, right now, obviously, we're in a rising interest rate environment. Credit spreads are widening enormously. Um, I just saw the 75 basis points was put out. I'm sure you all saw that as well. Um, but there's a lot of issues with that. So when we have credit spreads widening, we have we've seen before in the prior crisis, um, what tends to happen like with the rating agencies. This data is so important and it's so important that it's timely because now we're gonna have the same sort of things happening with like these leveraged loan deals. Um, there's, there's so much out there that's so structured and so complex. And I think we're really gonna need to have those controls. Um, are the ratings timely or were they last looked at five years ago? Um, we also have a secondary rating issue with a whole slew of new secondary rating agencies coming out. And I don't think that the auditors really know how to deal with that and separate that out between, you know, the top and the ones that are a little more timely and some of these newer agencies that sometimes do rate things a little bit higher. I am in <laughs> just didn't want to drone on and on, but um, another big area that I see my auditors real concerned with is the cryptocurrencies. And some controls around the kind of data that you use to check that I think would be really useful. Specifically, I would say um, the timing. So there's been a lot of discussion, you know, is the right time, you know, five o'clock Eastern, is that the close? Is it, you know, 12 o'clock Eastern? Is it 12 o'clock UTC? You know, what are the kinds of things, you know, with regard to this sort of data and how it goes into the financial reporting and ultimately into the interests of investors that we could perhaps um, focus on, be a little ahead of the game, um, especially going into, you know, what seems to be a rocky couple of years for markets. So that would be my general comment. Great, thanks, Susan. Uh, Jim Hunt, you're up next. Thanks, Charles. A, a couple of questions and I'll be as brief as possible because there's a lot of people that should and need to comment, but back to Jennifer's thought about the, the continued education of audit committees. I was really encouraged last year or the year before uh, when the board said that they were going to reach out to audit committee members or audit committee chairs of those uh, institutions whose work was being inspected. I think that's a great program. But I also think if you ask most audit committee members and chairs, you know, about the PCOB, they would be knowledgeable, but from a distance. That being that it this is a this is a matter for the audit firms to be concerned with, and us only on a on a you know derivative basis. And so I would continue to encourage the outreach to to much to many more audit committee members and chairs beyond the inspection process. And you know you could do the math on how many that would be. And I know you're out there, but but to determine a way, maybe it's a CAQ, maybe it's others. There's so many opportunities and webinars and things today to bring specifically audit committee members together and and have a, a further deep dive on the on, on the workings of the PCOB and how it does go into the importance of the uh, of the enterprise itself so that's one the second in, in terms of you know kind of what's emerging i've been observing and we all have uh, that the firms are considering for independence and other reasons you know splitting off audit audit uh, practices and um you know, there's, it's also been anecdotal over the years, I guess, that, that you know, some consulting practices have supported auditing practices in terms of margins and rates and returns. And I think that's something that, you know, even though the firms are saying we're just thinking about it or we're not thinking about it, but I think that's an emerging consideration that, that, that really has to be uh, kind of high on the list because there are things that will come out of that that will be important to, to PCOB, the mission of, over, of, of protection of investors and the profession itself. Charles, I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you. 
uh, and John Bindle. You're up next. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Charles. Uh, <clears throat> maybe three topics I wanted to comment on. Maybe they're both maybe some in the opportunities bucket, maybe one or two in trends. Other non-financial information, I'll be brief there because I think people hit on most of the things I was thinking about. Uh, data and technology, and then communication, maybe the PCOB strategy on communication. That's a bit multifaceted. Um, you know, other information, I think you know, a lot was said about ESG, but you know, I think we want to think about it a little more broadly. You don't want to, you know, there has to be some balance. You know, what is most material, most impactful, you know, to the financial statements, um, ESG clearly being one of them. And if we're going to open up the dialogue on what that would look like for ESG, isn't it a good opportunity to think about it more broadly by the PCOB? Because you're already going to be studying it, you know, in the context of ESG and how you could craft some standards on other information that is material and helpful for investors. I think, you know, opening it up a little wider would be helpful. Um, and then particular on the ESG front, um, you know, I think about data quality, modeling. I mean, there's so much that goes in to ESG disclosures that are grounded sort of in the processes that you would think financial information as we look at it are subject to. So I think, you know, it is closely aligned to the skills that the auditor can bring to bear to give assurance over that other information. I think, you know, there may be some resource and talent needs there that need to get supplemented, you know, depending upon the type of disclosures and the type of uh, resources that are needed for ESG or climate. You know, those are unique niches and skills. We've seen that with the people we've had to hire in our firm. So that's just one other information. Then on data in technology, I mean, people have talked about the rapid transformation. We're seeing in our business I mean, massive, massive change, you know, how we use um, distributed ledger to index rebalance the funds. I mean, the evolution of that, I think the PCOB could even take a more proactive uh, stands with how how do auditors more effectively use technology to deliver you know an opinion um, you know sampling seems historic a little archaic you know how do you look at large blocks of data um, you know I think the PCOB should lead with that and you know think about how they can encourage that real time plugged into the systems of the client how do you extract how do you do things you know, that really add value to the board, to the investors, to regulators. You know, you talked about broad constituents that the audit firm serve. Um, and more importantly, too, I think we, we want an effective and an efficient capital market system. It's just more efficient, right? I mean, the more you're going to drive technology and innovation, it's going to be more effective. You're going to get more value. The audit's going to be front and center from a value perspective, and you're going to be more efficient. So I think it just benefits a lot of different aspects of the capital markets. And then last on communication, um, the PCOB has done a lot of good things here and in the other areas as well. But I think, look, when you think about the boards and audit committee, I think you need to open up the architecture a little bit of, you know, what's being communicated. I think it's improved over the years. I think if you try to harness the data and technology, that will really improve the communication platform that you could give standards on that the auditors could bring to the board and, and management. And then there would be some thinking around what would go to the public, but that's more internal to you know, the board. And then on the investor front, um, I really was encouraged when I heard some of the dialogue earlier about your inspection reports, because I do think they've improved, but there's a long way I think you could go there with the inspection reports. I think um, helping them provide richer insights. Um, they're a really strong communication tool and you know, thinking about how you can continue to enhance those in a, in a plain English way and incorporating you know, different aspects, some of the things that, that George mentioned this morning. So those are three comments, Charles, from my end. Great, thanks. Uh, Steve Morrison. Hey everyone, so in terms of, of trends uh, overall, you think about it that, and we've all lived through this and we're all living through it now because we're sitting on this Hollywood Squares uh, meeting here. It's remote work by done being done by auditors and also remote work being done by the clients and the interaction of those two, it's not the same as sitting in the same room uh, with the client on site. The the talent shortages that, that are in there uh, combined with the, the new A&A issues that some of the other speakers here have, have alluded to, particularly digital assets. Also, to incorporate my prior comment about having multiple audit standard setters, in short, uh, all we're, we're all being asked to do more with less, so to speak. And to address this, and this is, I guess you could say this is somewhat healthy, some are going to innovate. 
and a lot of the firms that are here and others are already doing that by figuring out how can we restructure the engagements, how can we use technology better, how can we, instead of say doing the sampling and so forth, how can we make better use of substantive analytics and so forth. So the the auditing that was present when these standards were were written back you know, pre PCLB and then adapted after 2004, there's going to, I think, be some additional changes, which I know the PCOB is already looking at, with particularly in terms of audit evidence. And unfortunately, what I think both on the preparer and unfortunately some auditors as well, with having to do more with less, some will use that as an opportunity to cut out certain work that may be essential, or to say it more colloquially, is that some will cut corners which I think will drive more inspection I I issues and, and also enforcement as well. And I think also to, to close is that to, to address these new and emerging issues that we've been talking about, those digital assets, ESG, whatever ESG actually looks like when it, when it becomes live and so forth, also considering the, the X factor, the, those unknown unknowns that, that are gonna be coming up because uh, Two and a half years ago, no, no one expected us to be uh, in this COVID environment, for example, which I think kind of gets to the core of having principles based standards, but with also applicable practical uh, guidance in, in terms of those so that that firms implement this the, the, the correct way. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, and then I think the order is Preeti, Josh, Melanie, and then Sarah, but. Again, the encouragement for if people need to jump in uh, urgently, please feel free to just uh, interrupt uh, for the sake of uh, getting the conversation going. So Thanks, Charles. Mm -hmm. um, so let me just reflect on kind of three things from listening to the discussion, some of which I put in the chat box, um, but some of which I didn't. So on the ESG issue, I would really encourage the PCAB to um, partition kind of the SEC's proposal is a moving target and it's very hard to know where that's going exactly and what the role of auditors is. I would like to partition that from the existing opportunities to address ESG audit issues in the existing financial statements. Like we see, um, you know, depreciation estimates and other things. And John pointed out some inconsistencies that exist within the financial statements as they currently are reported. So I would advocate the PCOB kind of tackle the uh, ESG issue in a two-pronged approach and to separate the things that could be done now with existing uh, accounting standards and you know, leave for the future since we don't know what the SEC is doing, uh, the attestation of those, you know, potential disclosures as a separate issue. Um, that way they could make some progress on some some of the ESG issues. My second uh, concern, and I was happy to see that fraud was mentioned in the standard setting objectives, uh, because I think that this is a constant area when you talk to people uh, who don't know much about auditing, they automatically think auditors are doing something with fraud. Um, I, I heard Dane mention the word fraud and I honed in on that because I know I went back and did a little bit of research to see uh, the audit opinion changed, I believe, in 2017 and incorporated some new language about uh, some new standard language about auditors and, and their fraud duties. But I didn't see any change in the standards. And that really perplexed me and concerned me that we're setting up investors to think something is happening, but we don't see any corresponding change in the standards. That's going to create, as John uh, put, corrected me, the performance gap. Um, and I think that that is a, a problem and something um, I hope that the PCOB could address. And my third um, comment is about AQIs. I wanted to reiterate the importance of the AQIs uh, because it's in, in order to figure out which emerging issue is the most important issue to, to address, we kind of need to know what drives audit quality. And so I feel like that evidence is important. And when Keisha brings up the issue about talent, we know from research that turnover um, in the staff is a, is a huge problem for audit quality. Then in the face of this grace reg resignation, there'd be good reason to expect that we're gonna have bad outcomes from all of this resignation. So linking kind of the audit quality indicators and what 
we can kind of see as evidence of what they are to the actual problems that we face should help us prioritize, I think, what the PCOB should be doing. Thank you. If I could just um, just jump in a little bit to follow up on Priti's comment with respect to fraud, I think also thinking about no CLAR and the no CLAR efforts in relation to fraud risk discussions, um, I was disheartened when that item was removed from the PCOB's agenda. Um, but pleased to see when, when we had the IAG meeting last week that it's it's back on the table. I think these fraud and no CLAR issues are also a way to attract talent to accounting curriculum because what we found is student, um, a lot of the professors I'm sure could agree with me that students become very engaged when you know, they see the combination of basic accounting with these fraud and no CLAR topics. So that's just a quick, quick um, piggyback to Priti and Keisha's comment. Thank you. Josh. Yeah, thanks, Charles. Um, yeah, I guess maybe just to add on to a few of the comments, I, I think there's been some discussion about kind of the continuing prevalence of the use of, of data in the execution of, of the audit. And I think as John, as John may have mentioned, you, you know, as as auditors familiarity with, with data continues to grow, it, it really can open up lots of opportunities to really deepen your understanding of the company's business, um, can really help deepen the, the assessment of risks, help you identify, you know, patterns and anomalies uh, to, to really help you hone um, you're testing that much more efficiently and can bring lots of lots of benefits to the kind of the body of evidence that auditors leverage to form their conclusion in, in really in really remarkable ways. And so, you know, I think, um, you know, adding, you know, continuing, I know that between the audit evidence standard, um, as well as the data and technology task force, just really believe continuing to kind of challenge ways in which standards can Kind of further outline and promote kind of the use of, of data and technology would be would be really important um, as well as you know companies are continuing to expand their use of technology into things like artificial intelligence and which raises some very interesting questions around you know how do you think about financial reporting risk and and how do you evaluate the effectiveness of those of those processes um, but then stepping stepping back i guess building off some of the talent comments when you ask some of our there's a talent impact, I think, of some of these as well. As when you ask, I think, our younger professionals what really excites them about about the opportunities in the profession, uh, you know, kind of at the top of the list are opportunities to work on things like ESG, um, as well as their ability to leverage, you know, data and technology. Those those skills really are ones that they're very comfortable with and allow them to bring perhaps some more, you know, creativity to to the effort. And so, are things that are really exciting to to the younger professionals that join join the ranks and so hopefully you know ways in which the, those can become more more prominent um, will help encourage you know others to, to join the profession so those are just a few things to to think about great thank you melanie Melanie, you're up next, but you're on mute. Sorry, I was uh, putting my hand down instead of taking the mic off. I'm putting the mic on. Uh, this might be something that's more appropriate for the investor advisory group, but I think getting some information out there that's, you know, in the investor education universe to, you know, explain to investors why what the PCA would be done, why what auditors do is important, and how it's important to the investment decisions they make. Could be really useful because my sense of the PCAOB is people who are, you know, in the universe of this are aware of it, but investors don't understand necessarily how important the work is and what the work of auditors are. So I think that would go a long way to, you know, helping people understand what's going on and, you know, have issues brought to the PCAOB that, you know, individual investors may see. Thanks. And Sarah, you are up next. Thank you. So just if also adding on to some of the comments that we had um, so far, and I think I do obviously look at coordination among standard setting as being beneficial to the profession as well as to um, investors to understand, you know, you really shouldn't be getting a different audit 
if you happen to have a company that's domiciled internationally versus in the US. And one of the standards that um, John had mentioned with quality management, quality control standards coming out, I know the PCOB has was really involved with what the IWASB was doing. That's another issue or area where we have an opportunity to not necessarily draw a distinction to say fundamentally what our auditors are doing is different. And I think the more we can help reinforce that, yes, where we need to, our standards are being tailored for the U.S. markets. That's really important. That's that's mission of the PCOB. But overall, what the auditors are doing, what assurance you're getting is the same. So if you want to invest in companies listed here versus listed elsewhere, you don't have to be worried that the quality management of that firm is going to be different. I think there's a lot of you know, importance and, and that got back to some of the comments on just the why, the why of standard setting, the understanding what's on the agenda, the prioritization, which I think is incredibly helpful. And I think, you know, when he, I agree with everything everyone has said about technology and that being an exciting part of the profession, as well as helpful to what our clients are doing, what their uh, practitioners are doing. I also wanna think, uh, I guess maybe add an and to that of, you know, we had the presentation from George, There's roughly 1,700 registered firms, however many thousand issuers and broker dealers who use these standards. So we wanna make sure that as we're looking at the trajectory, it's enhancing and not detracting from, maybe there, there are companies that are listed that aren't quite as sophisticated technologically yet. And we need to make sure that what we're doing to enhance investor protection doesn't unintendedly harm anyone along the journey or a firm that maybe is smaller and has less access to some of the advanced resources, can they still do an audit that is successful, even if they don't have quite the breadth and body of advanced technology? So I think we wanna be very careful that um, we're staying principles-based and we're being inclusive of the entire environment that we're looking for. And just when we talk about the, the relevancy of everything we're doing, I think it's very important that, I love the discussion on uh, audit committees and what they want to know and the interaction with auditors. And that's something that the more the PCOB can work collaboratively, the better off we'll be. So if that's what we're hearing from investors and the standards are written that way. And then inspection drives that behavior. That's really helpful. And I think that's where then it goes back to down to the practitioner level. And, you know, it's maybe never fun to be inspected because the idea is that you're kind of getting questioned on what you're doing. But making that also a positive and a learning experience is really helpful as well. So I think the uh, you know the idea of uh, and we've had some co um, commentators say, well, I don't know if this is for the investor group or for the this group, and I feel like the answer is yes. Like the more we can have these collaborations that go across, and as the board is working together and the different uh, divisions of the PCOB are working together, the more we can be saying yes across the profession and yes, across the globe, I think the more successful it will be. Thanks, Sarah. And in some ways you teed up what I was gonna put in as the next question. Uh, and it's been a, a topic of conversation as we've uh, worked on the plan, which is how do you make sure the interactions with the external, all the external stakeholders are uh, being effective. And so the, the question for the group is really based on your interactions with the organization, like what do you see as opportunities to make those interactions more effective? Uh, but maybe to start this off, I'll, I'll like uh, maybe a, a soft invitation for the board or Barb uh, to talk about any of your thoughts about what you think a good way of interacting with external stakeholders uh, looks like. You know, Charles, I'll jump in briefly because I, I lost sound for a quick moment, um, but but I know that someone mentioned an investor liaison and we're very excited to have an, a new investor liaison joining us later this month. And so I think she'll be really key to developing a good strategy to working with, with um, the investor stakeholder group but we're also looking to hire someone to uh, um, specialize in the rest of our stakeholder groups. And those people are key. Um, I had to laugh at the comment were, that were, was made. I know it's really important to bridge um, conversations, right, between maybe the technical people 
and investors or us and audit committees. And so we're really looking forward to those people to fill that role. I know, I know that some of our members like Brian and Josh would love to talk technical auditing standards all day long, but uh, other people might find it boring. So I wanted to mention that um, the only other point I did, I did want to mention um, was, was on post implementation reviews, uh, which are a means of communicating, right? It's a means of understanding uh, the effect that standards have had. We, we do those. Uh, in fact, last week, the comment period closed on a post implementation review uh, for our estimates and specialist standards. So if that's something that the group would be interested in learning more about, maybe we can tee that up for a future agenda. Thanks, Barb. Uh, Jeff, I think you were up next. If you still want to make a comment. Well, thank you. I, I was still on the other questions, so I apologize. I was just going to make uh, three quick points about trends, some of which has already been covered. So I'll, I'll be, so, so just looking at some of the recent headlines in the, in the business news suggest there may be uh, some trends that uh, might uh, be factors for the PCOB to consider. Uh, so, so one was uh, what Susan uh, mentioned earlier. A lot of prominent economists, business leaders are are talking about a recession. So, uh, we we know uh, just looking in the past that that can have some impact on financial accounting and reporting. So that that would be one. Um, the second one uh, that Jim mentioned is the headlines recently uh, about uh, some of the firms potentially splitting off their their consulting business. Uh, so, so I think that. Might be a relevant factor to consider, and and the third headline uh, of recent uh, weeks was the Wall Street Journal story about the SEC, you know, looking into conflicts of interest and in, and in independence, uh, doing some investigations in that regard. So, just three uh, uh, headlines from recent uh, uh, news uh, events that uh, I think um, may very well be end up being trends that that are. Important factors for the PCOB to consider. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and then John Bukomnik and then Diane, I think you're next in the queue. Sure. Um, rather than clog the conversation or the chat with sort of, I agree with what everyone said and repeating them. I haven't heard any controversy or anyone disagreeing. Um, so I'd, rather than become more granular, I'd like to go out to like 50,000 feet, not even 30,000 feet, and go to where Chair Williams and the other members of the board greeted us this morning. And what I haven't heard and what we all assume is the purpose of all these standards and activities and trends that we're focusing on and say that in terms of recruiting talent and everything else there is nothing more powerful than a powerful mission and the mission of increasing fairness and transparency and assurance in the u.s capital market is i'm just and this may sound naive but it's a noble one. And we sometimes forget that. And particularly in the US, someone mentioned principles based, the US tends to be rules based. And we all have all seen audits, which say we have complied with all applicable rules and the standards, and everything. But I would love at some point for that mission to be front and center. I know at one point they didn't do it but when the UK was considering all of their audit regulation, they were gonna start every audit with black line type that said the purpose of this audit is to, and not it wasn't comply, it was to provide assurance to the investing public and other stakeholders that the information contained herein, according to the UK phrasing, presents a true and fair picture of the financial statements. And I think sometimes when we go into all this micro, and this also gets to your communication question, we get lost in 
this accounting standard or this responsibility or this set of information or this technological thing. And one of the main things I think all this has to serve is reinforcing the ubiquity and nobility of the message. Um, so I will stop there because it's, it sounds like a soapbox. Um, but I, no one has mentioned it since the welcomes, right? And it seems to me that this needs to be put into that context. And all of it from the communication to which standards to how do we do it needs to say that. And we get too caught up in does it meet the standard as opposed to does it fulfill the purpose? Great. Thanks, John. And we probably have roughly uh, three minutes left. Uh, so we have Diane, uh, John White, and then we'll probably be uh, sprinting towards the finish line after that. Okay, I'll be I'll be quick. I'm I'm speaking as an audit committee chair on your interactions um, uh, with the PCAOB and the webinar for audit committees that was held on July 8th, 2020 was fabulous. But that was the last one I think that I've been told. And one of the reasons why it was so fabulous is because there was a pre-reading uh, list that included a PCA um, overview, um, a guide to reading the new inspection reports, update on data and technology project, um, conversations with the audit committee chairs, book uh, annual report, resource on CAMS, new, new standards. It was consolidated, it was concentrated, it was filtered for audit committees that could take an hour and do, do some reading ahead of time and really get totally filtered, concentrated, great information. So the more of those that you can do, that would be helpful because I don't think anyone on my audit committee would go to the PCAOB website and go to your audit committee resource thing and start just generally reading. So um, I would encourage more of that. It was very, very helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Diane. Uh, and John, you may be the, the cleanup hitter on this discussion. Well, I, I would love to close at 20,000 feet, but I'm going to go all the way down to ground level um, because I looked at your last question about what enhancements could improve uh, your interactions with the PCOB. Um, and I'm going to make this comment on behalf of, the, I guess, the, the, the people I know the, the best on, on this group, which are the auditors and the preparers. Um, and I think I've heard this from both of them, um, but I feel like one of the things that uh, we need at the PCOB today is a forum when we are work working on standards for the auditors and the preparers to be in the room at the same time uh, talking about, I'm just going to say the minutia of the new standard on confirmations or the new standard on estimates or whatever it is. It's not big picture issues that, uh, and I, I, that are of particular concern to investors. And I don't mean that, that investors would be excluded from these gatherings. I just think we need a forum where the people that are in the trenches actually implementing the standards uh, can get together and talk in front of the uh, the staff of the PCOB and the, and the PCOB itself uh, about the the minutia of implementation. Um, so I just that would be a a suggestion of something that I don't think we have at the moment. So that that's sure. at ground level. I'm looking at Christine. She, are you going to be well, I, Yeah, I, yeah, John. I think that's a good thought. I mean, I also think of it from just thinking about the robust standard setting agenda. I would encourage just a formal consultation process about standard implementation. And maybe you can think about the way that the SEC Office of the Chief Accountant or the Division of Corporation Finance does it. Uh, where it's a formal process where you can get views and it's a framework and it's established just to help make sure we get to the right answer. 
And this is uh, Dwayne Disparity. I, I, I might jump into your point. You know, one of the things to think about is how does this advisory group, the, the CAG, and I know you're talking more broadly than the advisory group, but we, in the charter, we talked about subcommittees, task forces. I think those are opportunities where some of you as preparers and auditors can think about how, you know, is that a form that would be helpful to us? And, and we need to think about that. But uh, I just offer that, that, you know, the charter does allow some structures that might facilitate something that you're talking about there. I, that, that sounds right to me. And I, and if I understood it from the description, you could have it, those subcommittee groups, people that were not members of the CAG, for example. So you could bring in additional preparers and additional uh, uh, auditors for those interchanges. Right. And then for transparency, uh, you know, those meetings could be public uh, and as, you know, as is what our default mechanism is. So I think good things to think about. And if I could just jump in, um, Barb mentioned this earlier, but uh, communicating and getting feedback from all of our external stakeholders is a high priority for this board. And it did lead to our creation of a new investor advocate, Saba Kumar, who's going to be joining to have opportunities in addition to the investor advisory committee for us to receive feedback from investors. And like we always have created a stakeholder liaison position, and they are going, that person is going to be um, charged with some of the convenings that have been mentioned, like Diane, um, the uh, audit committee webinar that you mentioned, John, this is an opportunity too for us to hear from preparers and audit committees as well. And so we are, um, we posted for that position and we're in the process of, of trying to make a selection, but I really do appreciate the feedback that we've received today on all the different ways that we might be able to um, continue to receive stakeholder input because that really does help us to forward our mission. So thank you. Well, we are a couple minutes over time. Uh, so I want to make sure uh, I'm not the cause of uh, further delay. Uh, so I think Barb or maybe Erica, if there are any other sort of final thoughts um, from you all to close out this session, uh, we can do so. I'll just say you're a very tough act to follow Charles. And so, uh, if everyone wants to take a break until three o'clock, please, please recharge and, and fill your coffee mugs. I, I don't want Charles to outshine, shine the last session, but thanks again. <laughs> Very good dialogue. Thank you so much. Well, well welcome back everyone. Um, and welcome to the last session of the day. Uh, we're going to spend some time talking about the current standard setting and research agendas. I'm going to give a brief overview of some of the projects on the agenda, and we have some questions uh, for you throughout the discussion. Uh, in closing, we may have time for other comments. I, I, I really appreciate that many of the comments you provided in the last session are, are relevant to this discussion, uh, but feel free to re reiterate your points. I mean, the last discussion was very good. I actually ran out of, of paper and some of the notes I was taking and had to run and get some more. Uh, I'll be anxious to go through the, the transcript after this meeting. Uh, before we get started, though, Lynn Turner had asked me about our headcount last week at the IEG. We're currently at 25 uh, full-time staff. We, we had a person join this week and have another in a few weeks. We certainly, like many of you, have, have been affected by the, the um, difficulty in, in, in getting talent in. Um, we do have open headcount in our budget, but, but again, it's been challenging to add on to people. I, I think what Lynn was most interested in is kind of a compare and contrast to the FASB staff. Um, Sue, if you want to comment, you're welcome to. Hal Schroeder, who is on the IAG, mentioned that he thought ar around the time he was with the FASB that, that you probably had around 80 people. Yeah, that, that's correct. We do, we have, um, uh, we don't have quite as many as we used to, um, just from an efficiency and effectiveness perspective um, and prioritizing. And, you know, we certainly still have a complement of practice fellows as well that we bring in from the firms, which I know, I don't think that the PCOB has the, the luxury of, of being able to do that. Yeah, that, that's correct. We, we have tried to be very creative in, in um, staffing up for the projects on the agenda. We, we've recruited 
about six people um, that used to work as a PCOB, including one of our former chief auditors, uh, to help bolster our staff. But, but nonetheless, wanted to mention that because Lynn had asked. So in early Barb, May, Barb, 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 it's it's Dwayne. I apologize. I've been doing this today. Um, I want to, you know, it, I don't know if we're apples to apples, Sue, in terms of the the twenty five that Barb is mentioning is purely her organization, but it is supported by uh, our Office of Economic and and Risk Assessment. It's supported by the Office of General Counsel and Standard Setting. There are all kinds of people that get involved. So if you did an FTE view of all the people involved in standard setting, it's gonna be well north of 25. So I, I just offer that, cause I didn't know if that 80 was kinda, did it include back office, did it include all the other support functions, or I just wanna make sure we're not misinforming folks. Yeah, um, I would say that, um, so our back office support folks, if you will, are not within that number. They're the Financial Accounting Foundation. Um, like, so, for example, our production folks and things like that, we do have, you know, a small population that might be included in there, but I would say it's probably only like, right, maybe like 6 to 8 FTEs, maybe. Okay. Um, I would say pure standard settings, probably around 65 ish. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but that's what I would surmise and that it okay. would also exclude, you know, the board and others. Right. right. Thank you, Sue. Thanks, Barb. Oh yeah, no, no problem. Uh, so, back in early May, um, lost my lost my notes here while we while I was changing a, over. Uh, so again, back in early May, we updated the standard setting and research agendas. As noted in the press release, the agenda represents the board's focus to modernize, simplify, and enhance our professional standards. As you've heard um, from the board this morning, the agendas meant. To not to be set in stone, but to be dynamic. Um, it currently sets forth six short-term projects where the Office of the Chief Auditor expects board action during the coming 12 months. In addition to the existing projects on other auditors and quality control, uh, we expect to take up non-compliance with laws and regulations, our attestation standards, going concern and confirmations. Uh, we've also added four midterm projects to our standard setting agenda, substantive analyticals, fraud, the interim ethics and independence standards, as well as the interim standards more broadly. Uh, while a formal action is not expected on these projects in the coming months, uh, we're actively engaged in furthering these projects. And as projects progress on the midterm agenda, we'll move them up to the short term projects list. Our research agenda just it very briefly continues to have two projects, data and technology and audit evidence. So I'll, I'll now give just a brief overview of, of each of the projects, happy to answer questions uh, along the way. So other auditors, we, we're amending our auditing standards to strengthen requirements for audits involving accounting firms and individual accountants. Uh, collectively, I'll refer to those as other auditors. Uh, and other auditors are, are different than the, the firm that issues the auditor's report, which, which I'll refer to as the lead auditor. The work of other auditors frequently accounts for a significant share of the audit and, and may involve areas of high risk of material misstatement. Working with other auditors can differ from working with people in the same firm, creating challenges in coordination and communication. And these challenges can lead to misunderstandings about the nature, timing, and extent of other auditors' work and can reduce audit quality. The amendments to the board's auditing standards are intended to improve our standards principally by applying a risk-based supervisory approach to the lead auditor's oversight of other auditors for whose work the lead auditor assumes responsibility and requires the lead auditor to perform certain procedures when planning and supervising an audit that involves other auditors. Uh, the staff believe the amendments take into account more recent developments in practice in, in lead auditors oversight of other auditors work, including the greater use of communication technology. By way of review, these amendments were originally proposed by the board in 2016 and in 2017, we issued a 1st supplemental request for comment on certain revisions to the proposed amendments. And in 2021, we issued a second supplemental request for comment related to the planning and supervision of audits involving other auditors. 
The second most recent supplemental request for comment sought public comments on further revisions to the proposed amendments. Uh, as you may have seen, yesterday we announced an open board meeting for next week on Tuesday, uh, June 21st, for the board to consider the adoption of the requirements for the lead auditor's use of other auditors. Uh, turning to quality control, uh, which we've heard a little bit about today, um, the objective of our project on quality control is to consider how our quality control standards should be revised to enhance and strengthen requirements related to a firm's quality control system. Um, today, a system of quality control is broadly defined as a process to provide the firm with reasonable assurance that its personnel comply with applicable professional standards and the firm's standards of quality. Uh, our current QC standards were developed before the PCOB was established. Uh, and I think we would all know that the auditing environment has changed significantly since that time, in, including evolving and greater use of technology, increasing involvement in the audit of other firms and other service providers. Firms too have changed significantly, as has the role of for, firm networks. Uh, historically, our advisory groups have indicated general support for strengthening our QC standards and including support for implementing a risk-based approach uh, and enhancing requirements around firm governance and leadership. Uh, as advances in internal quality control, quality management, and enterprise risk management suggest, you know, factors such as the involvement of leadership, focus on risk, clearly defined objectives, uh, monitoring and remediation of identified issues can all contribute to more effective quality control. Uh, on December 17th, uh, 2019, the board issued a concept release on a potential approach to, the, to revise the existing QC standards, and we received 36 comment letters. Uh, the staff are working on a proposing release to recommend to the board later this year. Turning to the other projects in our short-term agenda, uh, I'll start with noncompliance on laws and regulations. AS 2405, uh, which is called a legal act by clients, establishes requirements regarding the auditor's consideration of a company's possible illegal acts in an audit of financial statements. Both regulators and investors have focused significant attention on certain high profile cases involving violations of companies of laws and regulations that relate primarily to their operations rather than to their financial accounting and reporting. Uh, and these legal acts may not have an immediate and a direct effect on the company's financial statements, but, but often have direct effects, uh, such as significant fine and fines and penalties and reputational damage to the company. In response to these developments, uh, the NOCLAR project was added to our research agenda in 2016. And the project was designed to explore whether there is a need, uh, need for improvements to AS 2405 to provide better direction to auditors on their responsibilities with respect to the detection, evaluation, and communication of illegal acts. Uh, in 2020, it was removed from the research agenda. However, nonetheless, the staff have continued to monitor relevant developments. And as noted on the agenda, we hope to recommend a proposed standard to the board in the next 12 months. The attestation standard, so in connection with our project on assessing the PCOB's interim standards, which I'll cover shortly, we're considering the current requirements in the interim attestation standard. Uh, we currently have six attestation standards, and those include AT101, which serves as a framework for all attestation engagements, AT201, which covers agreed upon procedures engagements, AT301 addresses financial forecasts and projections. AT401 is reporting on pro forma financial information. AT601 is a compliance attestation engagement. And AT701 is for engagements regarding management's discussion and analysis. Now, the staff are aware of uh, engagements that currently use AT101, AT201, and AT601. For example, AT601 is used in the examinations of certain statements made by asset-backed issuers in connection with Reg AB compliance reports. Uh, and for investment companies, uh, the AT601 is used for Rule 17F2 securities accounts under the Investment Act. Uh, we're, we're not as aware of engagements or the extent to which engagements use AT301, 401, and 701. 
However, we continue to gather information to evaluate the extent these standards are used. Uh, turning to going concern, uh, auditors have had a longstanding responsibility under both PCOB standards and federal securities laws to evaluate whether substantial doubt exists about a company's ability to continue as a going concern in a subsequent fiscal year and to disclose the doubt in the auditor's report. Uh, our standard AS 2415, which sets forth requirements, um, hasn't been uh, uh, amended significantly um, since the board adopted it back in 2003. Uh, the project was originally added to the agenda following the financial crisis in 2008, and between 2009 and 2015, this topic was discussed multiple times by our advisor groups, and the staff conducted significant research in, including monitoring the effect of, of gap requirements, which came into play in 2016. As noted on the standard setting agenda, we're developing a proposal <clears throat> for the board's consideration in 2023. Uh, the confirmations project. So AS 2310 establishes requirements for the use of confirmations and audits, including requirements for designing, performing, and evaluating the results of confirmation procedures. The standard was first issued by the AICPA in 1992 and adopted by us as an interim standard in 2003. Uh, the PCOB first issued a concept release in April 2009 and a proposal in July 2010. Uh, the board's proposal received 27 comment letters, which generally supported aligning the standards with, with advances in practice and technology but highlighted some of the requirements as being overly prescriptive and inconsistent with the board's fundamental suite of risk assessment standards that were finalized in 2010 after the proposal was issued. We're currently working on drafting a reproposal for the board's consideration, taking into account the comments on the proposal. However, we acknowledge that things have changed since 2010. So in addition to more recent observations from our oversight activities, we're also thinking about how a new standard should reflect changes in technology. Before discussing the midterm agenda, um, we're going to pause to seek your views on a few questions. And so starting with the attestation standards, we thought we would use uh, the opportunity to ask uh, whether anyone on the call has recent experience uh, either with AT301, 401, or 701, or if anyone wants to highlight, you know, any certain challenges that exist in performing attestation engagements in accordance with our existing standards. Brian Credo. Uh, thanks, um, and, and thanks, Barb. Yeah, I think you um, summarized properly the attestation standards under which we do at times conduct um, in, in engagements, but 301, 401, and 701, PCOB 301, 401, and 701 are not standards that we um, we have applied recently. There, you know, it's been a long time since we've probably even had one or two of, of, of those kinds of engagements in the past as far as as far as I know. So I I, I think um, I think you've properly summarized uh, the usage of those. And then from an AICPA perspective, we do use certain of their attestation standards. Um, and, 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 but, but even, even still not relative to these types of engagements. So I think, I think you've kind of summarized the population, um, where we are making use appropriately. Christine Devine. I was just going to echo what Brian said that our experience is consistent with that, that we're not aware of engagements or I'm not aware of engagements under. Uh, AT301, 401, or 701, and I'm not aware of really any challenges either. The attestation engagements under PCOB standards that we perform are for the broker dealer engagements, and those are uh, well established in the, in the market and the industry. Any other comments on those? John White. Um, I first agree with Christine and uh, and Brian. I have not seen anything recent under those you know, under 301, 401, or 701. Um, I was curious. the The climate release says that the PCOB 
has an acceptable attestation standard in place for greenhouse gas. And I was just curious, which one of these is that and how would that work? <laughs> that being a well, question to, to you. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. I mean, primarily John AT 101 is a framework like standard that applies to all attestation engagements. Um, and so it, at a high level, addresses uh, review engagements along with examination engagements, uh, which are currently discussed in the proposal. Uh, we've not gone as far as to have very detailed discussion with the FCC staff about whether or how AT601 would apply. Um, so we're largely thinking about just a modernization effort on AT101. Okay, I mean, I was just curious whether the, whether they needed updating or review to uh, further respond to what the SEC says that we have in place. <laughs> well, that's a good question, and that that's certainly something we'll be at some point looking to do outreach or either through a proposal or something before that. Um, but again, some some of our standards that are, that are these interim standards are, are just getting kind of dated and. I found with standards, some of them age like like fine wine, and some of them age like old fruit. So, but most seem to age like fine wine. <laughs> Sarah Lord. Sarah, do you still have a comment? Yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Um, so I would um, say similar comments that we do not have. Have the current engagements under 301, 401, or 701. Um, but as we think longer term on challenges, a potential is just where do the PCOB standards apply as opposed to the ASCP standards? So, right now, there are instances where you might be performing an engagement for an issuer, but not under the jurisdiction of the PCOB and using ASCP standards. So, as the PCOB, um, as the SEC does work, as um, what the standards are used for changes ensuring that it's clear which standards, what is actually in our jurisdiction of the PCAOB when like if AT101 is refreshed. I think that could be something longer term that would be helpful. Thank you. Lynn Turner. John's comment, I've gone back and looked at uh, 101 during the SEC rulemaking process and 101, <clears throat> does not even re come remotely close to providing the level of guidance that auditors would uh, need. It's the basic framework that was then used, for example, in 701 in, divide, in devising or coming up with the um, MDNA attestation. So 101, despite what the SEC says, is, is not the standard and uh, for greenhouse gases, uh, the AICPA, as I recall, has something out there, but it is inapplicable because it's public company. So the PCOB would have to develop something. Uh, John, I'm not worried as much about the timing as perhaps uh, you are. I think the ESG rulemaking is going to be done twice. Uh, it's one going to be once by uh the sec and based upon the comment letters i've seen including from the legal profession which are all over the place and on both ends of the spectrum i suppose the courts are then going to turn around and have a a crack at this and so it could be some period of time before we ever see a, a rule whatever that might be uh go into effect um, if we are going over to 701, I assume you know the, the I'll call it the famous example on that one, which I think was led by uh, Alan Beller, my predecessor at, at the SEC. Uh, it was it was part of the Goldman Sachs IPO. I believe there was a 701 uh, attestation engagement just to go look at the example that got the most profile. But I don't yeah. think there's been anything since then as a practical matter. No. It, it, there, there's like one or two cases of 701 being used. I was at the commission at the time. They did the consideration 
of the firms asking audits be done on MDNA and and rejecting that and the AICPA come, spend time to come up with 701, but then it's for all practical purposes. It's never been used more than the number of fingers that you got on one hand. <laughs> so, uh, and and you know everyone came up with a lot of good things to add to the PCLB's agenda, but I've sat back down and looked through that agenda along with things like ESG and um, the business model. Business model probably, given the trends, needs to be on the agenda and all. But when I've tried to figure out how you would do each of these projects and the time it would take and the staffing it would take, and realistically, you've got a two and a half year time frame here till the next national election. And I, I, I can't get to the point of where the board can get done what people want it to get done with the existing resources. It just will not happen. It hasn't happened for the 20, last 20 years, and it's certainly not going to happen in the next two and a half. <laughs> You're probably right, but I'm still going to have a later suggestion. But we'll wait. We'll wait till we open up the conversation. <laughs> go, Thank go for it. <laughs> Thank you, Freedy. Freedy, do you still have a question? Sorry, I thought I unmuted myself. Apparently, I'm still not good at this. Um, I was just reflecting on in the past um, when AT101 might have been used, and I'm maybe you can help me remind me, but when we moved to ICFR requirement, I guess at first it would have fallen under AT101, but then they the PCOB passed AS2 and then AS5. Is that correct? There used to be an AT501, um, which addressed kind of uh, the, not, I won't, don't want to call it the equivalent because that would be uh, quite the overstatement, but the, the, the kind of address the beginnings, that reports on right, the, the yeah. early. Okay. Yeah. So I guess we would follow the same model if ESG came along. It would initially fall under 101, but we'd actually, I would expect the PCOB would have to flesh out some more detailed standard like they did for for internal controls yeah certainly to lynn's point others have done that others have have gone more specific um with respect respect to specific subject matter jessica are there any other questions on this or we'll no no to the next time. set of questions yes okay thanks everyone um so we did want to at least tap into this group's knowledge about um with respect to no CLAR, going concern and confirmations, some have been subject of public actions for input. Um, all three have been subject of advisory group discussions multiple times, uh, but yet we know that things change. And, and so, you know, to the extent anyone wants to inform us on topics that, that aren't addressed by these standards that should be considered as part of the project, or are there current challenges in practice that should be considered as part of these projects? John White. You're on mute, John. Are we still on those three or are we ready to start on a new topic? I, I was oh, I'd like to stop on these three, but but oh. um if you if you have another comment, I'm happy to hear it. No, no, I want to talk about audit quality indicators, but I but I you should finish on this first. Okay. Um, Brian Croto. Yeah, it seemed like it was quiet on this topic, so I I, I just um, add. I mean, I think um, certainly certainly there could could be room for improvement in the standard. On the one hand, on the other hand, it goes back to I think my earlier comment of understanding the objectives and what what we're trying to or what you're trying to accomplish in making any in, in, any change with non-compliance and laws and regs in particular. The same would be true, I think, um, on going concerning confirmations. I would I would just say that. Um, you know, again, on all these, it's a matter of are you fundamentally changing objectives? Are you are you trying to improve performance um, kind of against existing objectives, if you will? And I think we could have a, a granular discussion about each one of these 
um, relative to that confirmations maybe is a little different in that there, there's a fair amount of modernization and, and, and I know you received a, a lot of feedback back um, back back years ago um, over a decade ago and, and now things have evolved since then but at least as it relates to laws and regs and going concerns I think that's where a fair amount of dialogue would be useful up front relative to what what problem we're trying to solve and what the objectives are um, and, and, and then from there having a more informed discussion um, about where it might fit from a prioritization perspective but um, I suspect you know most most would probably agree there's there's some degree of Enhancement or improvement that could make, be made to these these standards, but but then then the difference in opinions may lie in the, the details of, of what the overall objectives are and what kinds of changes would make sense. Yeah, that's a very fair point. I, I mean, you see these on the agenda because stakeholders have continued uh, in the public domain to say that these were important projects for the board to take on. And when, with that, I'm talking about no non compliance with laws and regs and going concern. Um, and there, there's room for at least at a minimum, right? Our, our focus is on investor protection at the end of the day and making sure that audit quality is there. Um, but, but even at a minimum, there's opportunities to, for example, align the standards with risk-based auditing that all the firms have um, embraced and improved on over the last decade um, to put things in PCOB terminology so that the performance requirements are clear and everyone's on the same page about what's required of them. Yeah, and Barb, that, that's where I was headed as well. I do think, and, and that's sort of where the IWSB and ICP have headed relative to better alignment relative to risk assessment, uh, control considerations and the like. And I think um, th those those kinds of changes and modernization make a lot of sense. Yeah. Christine Devine. Yes, um, thank you. First of all, Brian and Barb covered a lot of what I was going to say. I was going to generally say I'm definitely supportive of the No Car and Going Concern project. And Barb, you mentioned just really better aligning with the risk assessment standards. I think that's important. Clarity with respect to the definitions within the standard, and that includes the scope of the laws, I think will be important. Same thing on going concern as far as alignment. In this case, it's alignment of the auditing standards with the GAP standards. And if if there's changes there, just coordinating that with the FASB uh, with respect to their GAP standard on going concern. Yeah, we, we will try to avoid c c creating any issues for FASB. Um, we do want to also consider how to make the standard actually framework neutral, as we've heard some input over the years from, from people in the international circles. So. Lynn Turner. Lynn, do you still have a comment? Sorry about that. To Brian's comment about objectives and what you're trying to do. The, the IAG, the previous IAG, I think did an excellent job of laying out exactly what they're trying to get at and uh, laid it out in the materials that were put out on the website. And I think most of the current board members have, have received. And, you know, probably the best example of why that's important is Wells Fargo, where auditors were aware of issues and then didn't report out and that does tremendous damage uh, to the reputation of an audit and to the auditors. And it's not something that engenders confidence. And uh, uh, NASPA's weighed in on this issue as it's been debated here in the US and internationally, the International Standard Center has upgraded the standard where it's better than what we have here in the US, which is kind of, quite frankly, frustrating to see that internationally, they're able to leapfrog us in things like this standard or like in the CAM standard. So I think this is an excellent item to have uh, on the agenda. I'm glad to see it come back. And I think most investors are gonna be very happy to see this one. Thank you, Lynn. Keisha Williams-Smith. I guess this is almost a leapfrog kind of comment to what uh, Lynn just mentioned. I just wanted to know for these topics, absolutely in support of the moving forward. But 
I think our earlier conversation was around, you know, the other standard setters. So I just wanted to make sure, or even if you can give some context on um, the considerations as you're looking at modernizing or updating these standards or bringing them back as it relates to the other standard setters to minimize, um, you know, any, you know, differences uh, between, you're going to have differences where a different jurisdiction, but, you know, kind of what are you all's thoughts as you're looking at what um, the IAASB has done and also what the ASB has done, just to keep that in mind, because they have gotten kind of ahead of us on some of these topics. Yeah, sure, Keisha. Um, you know, as a general matter, we, we independently assess whether our standards need to be updated, but but as part of the staff's research, we consider work of, of other standard setters, including both, both the AICPA and ASB. Our pro pro proposals included a high level of comparison to facilitate commenters, um, you know, reading of our of our proposals. Uh, we consider them, we, we also consider when the last day updates were, um, but we also consider information that we have from our, you know, live boots on the ground through our oversight activities. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, we do have to be mindful that we're an audit regulator. Um, there are no other comments, Barb. Okay, uh, if everyone is ready to move on. So turning to the midterm projects, I, I think I heard someone mention substantive analytical procedures. Um, again, a fairly aged standard, but we're considering what changes might need to be made to better align the standard with the risk assessment and to address the increasing use of technology tools uh, that contribute to more effective substantive analyticals. Uh, the, and the analytical procedures um, can be a very important part of the audit process. Um, and they can range from simple comparisons to the use of complex models that include many relationships and elements of data. Uh, when used as a substantive audit procedures, analytical procedures involve comparisons of recorded amounts or ratios developed from recorded amounts to expectations developed by the auditor. And the auditor develops expectations by identifying and using plausible relationships that are reasonably expected to exist based on the auditor's understanding of the client in the industry and in, in which the client operates. Uh, another project on the agenda, which, which I'm sure some people will be excited to see, is a project on fraud and considering how AS2401 should be revised to better align the auditor's responsibilities for addressing intentional acts that result in material misstatement and financial statements <clears throat> with the auditor's risk assessment. Uh, including addressing matters that may arise from developments in the use of technology. Um, I, I, I'm not a fortune teller, but I would anticipate future advisory group discussions on, on all of the topics on the midterm agenda. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll move to the rest of them. Uh, you'll see a project on the interim ethics and independent standards. So in connection with taking a look at the interim standards, uh, we're considering whether PCOB registered firms and their associated persons existing obligations should be updated or enhanced or promote compliance through improved ethical requirements. Um, and then more broadly, with, with respect to the rest of the interim standards, and, and I probably should have defined that first, but, but I think many of you are familiar with the term. Uh, but when we look at the interim standards um, that were adopted uh, upon the establishment of the board, we're, we're taking a look at what's left uh, and of that, what, what should be amended, replaced, or potentially even eliminated as appropriate. Uh, and as part of this analysis, we will evaluate which are necessary to retain of those which should be re retained, which ones might be retained with minimal updates, and, and those which re may require more significant changes. Uh, for those that we believe require more significant changes, uh, we would likely have, have them as separate projects on the agenda. Uh, we may have requests for comment on potential standards to be eliminated. Um, and as we complete our analysis, we'll make recommendations uh, to the board to update the agenda. Uh, this slide just shows um, that there's, there's certain categorizations um, that remain of the interim standards. Um, and in some cases, as we said, <clears throat> we're, we're aware of frequent use of a number of these 
but for a small portion, we, we really don't have much insight uh, through our, our, our observations or, or our other regulatory activities. So we, we thought we would take again the, the opportunity um, to ask a few questions on and just the use of these standards. We, we are aware, I think, that um, AS 6101R standard uh, is used for letters for underwriters. Um, so in the case of that one, you know, certainly interested in any challenges that, that you're aware of. Um, with respect to the special report standard and reports on applications of accounting principles, um, interested in, in whether they're, they're used at all today. John White. Um, well, on the assumption that uh, 6101 is one you'd expect me to comment on since it's in, in the world I live in, um, I did, uh, Barb, do a little bit of uh, inquiry of, of my underwriter friends and, and the lawyers that represent them. And I think that when it's used all the time, it's just, it's a very, I mean, it's used, it's what, it's the under, it's the basis for comfort letters. But I don't think that there are any issues that are really uh, that troubling. And so in terms of, you know, how to allocate your time, um, I'm not sure that's where you need to spend it. Uh, some of the issues that have been there, such as how do you cover non-GAAP measures, that seems to have been worked out that you get comfort on the, on the components, but you don't need comfort on the, on the you know, on the, on the math. Um, there, the auditors want basically a release with respect to uh, responsibility or, or liability, and the underwriters are okay giving that because this is a due diligence defense. They're not seeking to hold the underwriters liable when they're getting comfort getting comfort letters, um, and so I, just kind of the the areas of friction I think have been worked out between the auditors. And the underwriters and so my sense is that it's working okay and probably not the best place to spend your time but glad to you know, you know offline talk about yeah, it thank more, you or you know get people that would help you talk about it more sure thank you brian Crotto. thanks and i i guess i would agree with john on on 6101 on comfort letters that there isn't a practice issue on the one hand on the other hand, at some point, if you're updating standards, obviously there's sort of a lot of outdated reference and, and like the ASCPA has gone ahead and updated this quite some number of years ago. Um, and, and, you know, the audit practice and the audit practices task force of the ASCPA, which sits under the regs committee does spend a fair amount of time um, on, on, on comfort letters and the like. And I agree with John, I don't think there's a practice issue to be resolved, but, um, but if you are considering updating it, there's certainly plenty to, to update there in terms of it being updated. And, and, and in light of that, I, I think this is one where in particular, you would want a task force um, to pull together um, to, to understand kind of current practice and some of the issues. And I think the same would be true for what you don't have on the list, which is AS4101, the old AU711, um, an association with SEC filings. That's another one where, again, I don't think there's practice issues to resolve. It's, it's it, we're sort of, we, we work through it, but, um, but but there is a fair amount that's sort of outdated and, and modernization that if you're, you know, if you're getting around to updating, they, they both would need that. Um, on 6105, we, we, we don't really issue um, reports under under that standard and, and, and really not much to talk about under 3305 other than um, some in the broker dealer space and, and some unique circumstances or otherwise. And a lot of what we would see there would be AICPA. Um, reports, although the volume is, 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 is not tremendous. Um, so I think, I think there's probably not a lot here. That's a practice issue, if you will, but, but nonetheless, some, some updates, certainly a lot about outdated references and the like. Thank you, Brian. Josh Jones. Yeah. Thanks, Jessica. I mean, not just to, just to kind of add on a little bit, just to, you know, I think nothing in incremental to the 6101 discussion that then John and, and Brian, I, you know, just just to add on, I guess, too, that on the special reports side, I, I think when we use those, it is, it is pretty infrequent. And as Brian said, probably more often, those are situations that come up under AICPA audits. Um, but, you know, when they do come up, although it's rare, it's, I, don't, I can't speak to, I don't, I'm not aware of any particular challenges. And um, the 6105, I, same thing, we don't typically leverage that one that much. 
Barb, there are no other comments at this time. Okay, thank you. All right, um, now we'll spend a few minutes on, on our research projects. I, I think both were mentioned in the last session, um, but we maintain a research agenda that includes areas of focus that have not yet moved to standard setting. And at the moment, we have two projects on the research agenda. Uh, the objective of our project on data and technology is to assess whether there's a need for guidance, rulemaking, or other regulatory actions in light of the increased use of technology-based tools by auditors and preparers. Because technology used in the audit continues to evolve, we continue to update our understanding, um, including by working with our data and technology task force, along with our colleagues in the Division of Registration and Inspections. Uh, while most of our activities do focus on the auditor's use of technology, we, we certainly try to keep abreast of changes in technology by preparers in the financial reporting process, as we've always been of the view that those changes could have a significant and, and potentially quicker effect on the nature of audit if evidence available to auditors. Uh, in general, uh, audit firms are increasingly using technology, although the extent and nature of that still varies fairly significantly. Over the last few years, um, our focus has been on taking deeper dives into a number of our standards and considering the application of current technology. Uh, but I would just say we're being deliberate in our research and recommendations in this space. Uh, while, while some believe that the standards should go further to encourage the use of technology, uh, we're also mindful about what guardrails might be needed to help guide auditors use technologies in ways uh, that result in obtaining sufficient appropriate audit evidence. And we want to focus our potential changes where, where audit quality will be improved by the use of technology by firms of all sizes who conduct audits under our standards. I think it came up in the last session, but uh, we, we do see a number of smaller firms who, who really aren't using technology much at all. And so it's always a challenge of thinking about how you maintain standards uh, that really work for, for audits of all kinds. Uh, our audit evidence project was added to the agenda in late 2020, uh, primarily as a result of research stemming from our project on data and technology. And the purpose of this project, like others on a research agenda, is to assess whether there's a need for guidance or changes to our evidence standard, given the increasing prevalence of technology-based tools, along with the increasing availability and use of information from sources external to the company, both in financial reporting and as audit evidence. Uh, we understood from our research that auditors were looking for some additional clarity on applying the requirements in our standard when using information obtained from sources external to the company as audit evidence. Uh, and so, I, don't, I guess it was a year ago, around a year ago, it feels like a much longer time ago, uh, we issued staff guidance that focused primarily on those considerations. Uh, the guidance also addresses how, how you consider uh, the relationship between the quality and quantity of audit evidence when obtained from outside the company. We continue to conduct research and engage in outreach activities, uh, certainly have followed the activities of other standards and other standard setters and will be very interested to see where that goes. Um, that really concludes my prepared remarks. Um, as in earlier sessions, if, if you have any comments or, or catch-all comments, anything you want to emphasize from other sessions, um, certainly interested in hearing that. Um, for, for people who um, mentioned that guidance would be useful in areas, you know, any more specificity on what that guidance might specifically address would certainly be of interest to the staff. Brian Croto. Thanks. Um, Barb, I just want to come back to maybe your research projects and then the interim or the midterm midterm projects, if you will, and link some of these together. I, I do think on substantive analytics, you could easily link that to considerations relative to both data and technology and audit evidence. And I, I think the task force that you had in place relative to data and technology was useful in terms of, of, of creating a, a, a good dialogue that I, I hope I hope you all found useful as well, but I, I would encourage continuation of, of, of that, just given the pace of change here. But I would I would think about your substantive analytics um, project, your midterm project in connection with both of these research projects. Um, and, and then as it relates to some of the other mid, midterm projects, I just want to comment again there, I think a deeper discussion of kind of what, what, what you'd be intending to accomplish would be really important because 
obviously there are important existing requirements and obligations around things like fraud and, and, and certainly around independence and ethics and um, understanding kind of what 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 we've identified as areas for 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 change and, and what we're trying to solve for would I think um, you know result in, in the ability to have a deeper discussion um, that would be, be be more meaningful relative to feedback on prioritization and those kinds of things when 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 it makes sense and in due course. Certainly, thanks, Brian. And I have no other comments at this time. You used your good material in Charles's session. I knew, I knew that would happen. It kind of happened at the IAG last week. Lynn Turner. Um, Lynn. On, on the research projects, as we talked about at the IAG, it would be good to uh, undertake a study of the CAMs that are being uh, disclosed on an international basis versus the CAMs that are being disclosed in the U.S. Um, reviewing those indicates that uh, the in international CAMs are providing more relevant information, including in the e e uh, SG area or climate change area to investors and what we're getting in the US. So going back and undertaking a study to figure out why those are, whether it's standard or people's reluctance in the SE in the US to provide better information would be uh, very what worthwhile. And I would think that uh, uh, that could be helpful to the board as well as to investors. On the technology issue, someone earlier today talked about technology and raised the issue about publicly available uh, data with uh, what's transpired with technology and uh, databases and all. There's significantly additional data out there in public domains that aren't being considered by auditors, but being used by research analysts or other people on Wall Street who are finding issues with financial statements as a result of that. And so it is a, a point where consideration needs to be given to expanding where auditors are obtaining evidence. For so long, our audit has been a culmination of a process in which management gives the numbers and the financial statements to the auditors. Auditors uh, get that data, start going through their process, request evidence, management then gives them the evidence to support those numbers. As if one might think if the numbers were, were wrong, they're gonna give them data that would call them into questions that history of studies have shown that just doesn't uh, happen so as we bring technology to the fore part we need to think about how we can improve the quality of audits by using or expanding uh, the evidence that we look at beyond just what management gives us or the company gives us and into these public uh, databases that's where the real bang for the buck is going to come on technology Um, John White, I know you've been waiting for this session. <laughs> well, I've been waiting to talk about what I think is missing. Uh, <laughs> I didn't realize it was missing until I listened to the IAG uh, program uh, or session last week. But uh, when Lynn said, where are audit quality indicators? Um, and as you know, you, there were enormous amount of time spent on audit quality indicators five to ten years ago by the by the PCOB staff and, and kind of get lining things up and getting things ready. Um, and now they're not on the agenda. Um, I guess I wanted to just, and, and, it, and it's, it came up a lot on the IAG and it came up this morning in, in several different, uh, uh, Preeti and Jeff and, and George Boddick talked about it in different ways. I actually had a, a slightly different angle on audit quality indicators that I wanted to suggest 
that you might want to focus on that I think gives you a lot of bang for the buck if you can do it. Um, and that is audit quality indicators uh, to help audit committees do their job. Um, and I guess if I go back to SOX, the, you know, the, the two things that affected the audit the most that came out of SOX were um, obviously creating the PCOB, but the other thing was putting audit committees uh, in charge of or responsible for the hiring, supervision, and firing of auditors. So, and it really, it's, it's the audit committee that is active in every company with respect to the job that auditors do and helping them plan the audit. Uh, they're supervising the audit. Uh, they're also hiring the auditors for it or firing them if they want to replace the auditors. And I feel like they could do their job a lot better if in in planning audits and, and helping and, and responding to audit plans that are coming in if they had good information about audit quality indicators. Um, not information that is specific to particular firms, but just I mean, I, you know, I was looking at kind of a list of the ones from one of the earlier uh, sessions or things that the, uh, that the staff did back in 2013, but, you know, the level of experience of the audit team members, the ratio of partners to junior staff hours, the use of subject matter experts and how, how much they're involved, industry experience, training hours, turnover, uh, past history of the engagement partner, use of technology, use of other auditors. Uh, and, and today I would throw in, you know, remote remote work versus uh, uh, in-person work when you're doing inventory, for example. I, I feel like you could say, well, I know whether, how I'd like some of those indicators to be, or some of those factors to show up in my audit um, and an audit committee as they're helping, looking at an audit plan that you might say, well, I know what I want, but I don't, I, I don't think you have any real idea of which of those factors align with a high quality audit. And I was listening to George this morning and I feel like you're inspecting audits like crazy. And if you could figure out, you know, what are the indicators that align with quality audits uh, just based on historical experience and provide that information to audit committees, they would use that as they are looking at the audit plans that are being presented to them. And the auditors would start aligning their presentation with what were you know, laid out as the indicators that were useful or good. Um, and I, I, just, I, I feel like you could have quite an impact uh, in influencing how audits are done without having to deal with being critical of any particular audit firm and what they've done in the past or having, having them respond to you know, audit problems they might have had in any particular audit. You're just trying to identify the indicator that this makes a difference um, and or which ones make a difference. And then the audit committee can implement those in selecting their audit auditor or more, or more importantly, laying out the parameters of how they want the audit staffed and conducted. Anyway, that's that, that's my spiel on that one. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, John. And like I said, I guess, I guess all I'd say is it's not on the agenda right now. Again, this was meant to have a discussion about the agenda, just as we did with the IG, and, and we'll all go back and, and debrief. So thank you. Jeff Mahoney. <clears throat> just still three, three points. First on John's point, I agree with his comments. I, I think, um, Auto quality indi indicators could also potentially be useful to investors in some circumstances, particularly with respect to proxy voting on the auditor ratification vote or on the vote for uh, the chair or members of the audit committee. So that's something to think about. Second, uh, also support uh, Lynn's comments on critical uh, audit matters. 
but just note that this is the PCOB standard sets forth four types of uh, disclosures that could be provided in connection with critical audit matters. Uh, and to date, uh, typically what we see is response to the first two of those disclosures, um, but not any information about uh, uh, third and fourth one, which, which were the two that many investors expressed support for and that kind of line up with some of the information uh, that we're seeing in some of the um, CAM or uh, related CAMs, uh, uh, KCAMs at UK companies. Those those two items were uh, indication of the outcome of the audit procedures and key observations with respect to the matter. Um, those are the two you don't you don't typically see in the US, but we're seeing some of those in in the UK and many think of, uh, they're useful. Three, I just want to make another pitch as I did at the IAG meeting uh, for uh, what I think would be helpful. Uh, both in terms of agenda setting as well as uh, transparency of the PCOB. And that would be to establish a task force, preferably a task force, a uh, combined task force of this group and the IHG uh, that would uh, uh, prepare, issue a annual survey of uh, priorities for standard setting uh, at the PCOB. Uh, this is something that used to be uh, done on an annual basis by the Financial Accounting Standards Advisory Council. Uh, I understand they don't do it on an annual basis now, uh, but they did for many, many years. And I, I found it a very valuable uh, document uh, because it included not only views of a broad range of constituencies from the Financial Accounting Standards Advisory Council, which is similar in composition to this group, but it also included uh, the top priorities for each of the FASB board members and for the executive director who led the, the staff a standard setting uh, effort. So, um, you know, talking to former uh, board members, uh, they liked the survey uh, because it really forced them to focus long and hard on what they thought would be the top five, what they believe is the top five priorities. And, the ranking was one thing, but the more important thing was the commentary. So, in addition to ranking your top five uh, standard setting projects, you provided a description as to why those were in your top five. Survey also typically included a section where, to the extent you thought something should come off the agenda, you would describe that and give your commentary as to why. So, uh, my experience is that was a very, very useful document. So, my recommendation would be we'd have a joint task force, this group of the ISG. We put together such a document, we put it out for comment, we encourage the members of each group uh, to put their priorities down in their commentary. And we also encourage each of the PCOB board members to put down their priorities and commentary as well as uh, the head of the OCA staff. Uh, so uh, with that, those are my three items. Uh, thanks for your Thank you, Jeff. Steve Morrison. Hello, everyone. So, in, in terms of speaking about audit evidence, substantive audit analytics, and the in the use of technology, it kind of brings me back to to my mentor in the profession, who was a, a retired Deloitte partner, who who used to say to me that so much of auditing was just asking, "How do you know?" And and in and in practice, and in in the national office capacity, I find myself I keep going to that, especially now. With all the discussions uh, on the increased use of technology and all the data that's that's available, and is this really going to get us to sufficient appropriate evidence and and so forth, or is it really just figuratively noise? And and so it comes something that was a, kind of I've heard a few different places like, hey, there's so much data that's out there, or about encouraging the use of technology and so forth. And I agree that it it might be effective in some points, but it's not necessarily always going to be fit for purpose, if you will. So personally, I have a hesitation about standard setters encouraging technology as opposed to facilitating technology. So, and this is to get to, to Sarah Lord's point to an extent about, you know, not every client has sophistication and, and not every client that has sophistication has sophistication in every area. That doesn't mean that the financials aren't in conformity with GAAP and that the audit was not high quality. 
and and then two something that you said a few moments ago barbara about the the specificity of the practice aids and, and guidance in terms of standards implementation or or just the continued application of standards and in, in kind of a changing environment i realize it's easier said than done to kind of think about how much specificity should the pco be will it be useful will it become a de facto uh, template, if you will, that everybody's going to revert to and not put enough thought into. But I, I think too is that, I think maybe it, it, two things, and I'm, I'm, I know one of them is happening where the PCOB takes a step back and says, "Wow, we've written a lot of Part One A, a Part One Bs on this one issue. Maybe more guidance is needed." So I encourage that type of process to continue. But also, I think before the inspectors hit the field, maybe the 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 in, to the extent that it would be is like, well, what are the inspectors going to be looking for and so forth in terms of the requirements in terms of say documentation in consideration of the, the use of technology or whatever it is and so forth. And I think that as, as difficult as I know it is to, to do, but the more that there are examples, practice aids, illustrative examples that, that are there, I think go a long way, particularly in that small and medium sized firm environment because I think it's better for the, it's in the public interest, if you will, in terms of that these issues, these thought processes and so forth are kind of brought to the forefront earlier in the audits, as opposed to say through an inspection process and, and, and remediation a, as you go forth. But again, like I said, I realize that's a lot easier said than done. And it's hard to, to, to determine, you know, how much is too much or where we should spend our particular limited time. And then as an overall statement, it, it's that there, there are too many auditors, I think, that have a, have a fear of inspection and that that's being used. And in reality, the auditor's objective, and this is just me speaking for me, is that our focus should really be on doing high quality audits. And what we do in our engagements is really not for fear of inspection or I'm just doing this because of, of an, I, I'm worried about inspection down the road or I, you know what, the inspectors won't ask about this, so I'm not going to worry about it much. The focus on everybody really needs to be on on performing those, those high quality engagements. I really, what I'm just kind of saying is like, mom, apple pie, Chevrolet, that's, that's kind of straightforward. But kind of having that emphasis on on doing the right thing, and I realize that runs counter maybe to what I just said about the need for more guidance. So I, I do recognize that there is a a balance, if you will. But the the illustrative examples of practice aids, I have gotten so much benefit over the years, and some of the the practice alerts and so forth, staff alerts that have come out that I've used them on AICP engagements as well, like on the professional skepticism side and, and so forth. And I think just as the, the profession is going to be changing a lot, whether it's the introduction of whatever ESG winds up being, whatever it is we need to do about it, uh, the changes to attestation standards that might be coming, but also I think core to this is the audit evidence and, and, and recognizing that people is like, hey, is this data? Just because you Googled it and found it on the internet doesn't necessarily mean it's something that's useful whatever guidance that could be given, the more tangible, and, and I realize it to be, be ever evolving, I think would be helpful to practitioners in focusing on the quality of what they do. Thank you, very insightful. John Lakomnik. Uh, you're muted. It may be another sound issue, Jessica. Okay. We can come back to you, John. Um, can you Mark? hear me now? Oh, yes, yes. we can. There you go. Great, um, thank you. Sorry. Um, I want to give a quick upload to the audit quality indicators being used. Um, I, I do think we have to recognize that we do not have a unified audit regulator here. The audit committees are under the guidance of the SEC and at the PCOB. That being said, that while as, as an audit committee chair, I actually used some of the old audit quality indicators that had surfaced during the earlier research projects to ask and we changed auditors. And one of the things was asking each audit firm which their own audit quality indicators they thought were applicable and how they traced them and what they were going to do about it vis-a-vis -vis that particular engagement. So just um, for what it's worth an endorsement of that. 
On, I think the other thing that you have to be aware of is these are not siloed. So on data and technology, we had a conversation earlier about talent. Um, you know, one of the things that audit firms are hiring now is not auditors, it's data scientists. And it's being used for everything from risk analysis to retention, um, to looking for disconforming evidence through public databases, which are all very good things to, to do. But I think that as you're writing your standard, for instance, on supervision of other auditors, there's also, and there has been supervision of specialists, but I don't think that supervision of specialists refers to supervision of non-CPAs on the audit team within the firm. And so you, you, I think you have to understand that the talent, the technology, the data, the supervision of other auditors, the supervision of other specialists, we all sort of interweave into a pattern um, that needs to be doable while giving enough leeway to allow for innovation in how the data is being used. Um, so I just wanted to, to note that because we were sort of talking about them all sequentially as if there were walls around them. And I think there's a lot of overlap and spillage. Yeah, that's correct. That's one of the things that makes it very challenging. Thank you. Brian Carter. Oh, thanks. And um, I just wanted to come back to a couple of the topics that others have raised. Um, and, and, and that's um, maybe C cams and K cams. And I, I think it's a great observation that that, that there are some differences and, and perhaps some are attracted to some of what they see in, in, in K cams. And I think we, we sort of have known that given the way the PCB standard was finalized, that there would in fact be differences. That's not surprising. I don't. I, I don't. I don't think. Although, although certainly it's it's good to assess and then think about other things we could do differently, prospectively. Um, one of the important differences, though, I think, as we reflect on that and gather information around it, is is just the linkage in the PCB standard to the financial statements and disclosures. And so, just for example, on on, on climate. One of the surer ways to see more CCAMs in that space would be for management to have a disclosure requirement um, around climate, um, which then could result in um, certainly more 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 CAMs. Today, you would see a CAM in that space primarily only in describing another area, an area of financial reporting and the and significant um, judgments and estimates um, or assumptions rather that that help inform that estimate. Um, part of that description could include a description of of, of climate, although. That's fairly rare, um, unless management's disclosures also um, have have that kind of information in it. And again, um, they that that may occur more frequently, and certainly will occur more frequently if the SEC proceeds with 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 their um, with with their proposal. So I guess I would just mention that there are sort of some reasons for that today. And I don't say any of that to suggest that we shouldn't step back um, into analysis. I know the PCB has done a good amount of post implementation review. You know, we and other firms participated in that, and, and there was public comment around it as well. And our uh, many of our partners participated in surveys in that regard. Um, I, I think there's a fair amount of, of good information the boards gathered um, relative to assessing the standards. So hopefully that's that's useful um, as, as well in that context. And then the other one I was just going to mention is on audit quality indicators, and I think it's a good a good discussion as as well to have. I think that's an area where. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot to be proud of relative to where, where, where I think the profession has come in that space. I know um, as someone who's involved in um, and oversees actually the development of our audit quality report, um, certainly our audit quality, quality report includes a large number of what we call transparency data points. And I think the comments that George Bodick made earlier are particularly important around, um, you know, simply the number of any particular, what some think of as AQIs, the, the, the number or the measurement itself without kind of the context around it may not be may not be all that meaningful. And we, we have found that in putting together audit quality report, that's that's especially true to describe what it is it's telling us. And as as much as I'd like to say that, look, you could look at one, two, three or five of these measures, and that's the magic formula to knowing if you're going to have a quality audit. It's unfortunately not that easy. If it if it if it were, <laughs> we'd, we'd we'd you know, we'd, we'd all be very lucky, but but. Um, but that's not to say there's not more to be learned. I think, John, to the points you're raising around are some more important than others. And, and we spend a lot of time thinking about that. And that informs how we actually present what we present in our audit quality report. And of course, then how, how the practice is managed. Um, so I, 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 think, I think those are all 
useful things for our, for for you know the board staff and, and and this group to be spending time on. I just thought I'd give a little little context on both of those because they are areas that I think um, you know on its surface sound like there's some easy things to do, but but there's a lot to understand and dig into. It's it's pretty complex. Both of those areas, both C cams versus K cams, and um, sort of a AQIs. There's a lot to to dig into and understand there, and it's it's more complex than might meet the eye. So I thought I'd just give that background. Yeah, no, thank you for that, Brian, because I, I do think that's one of been one of something that's challenged the staff, right? And and are what transparency data points you feel are important to PWC, are those going to be the same for, for Josh Jones at EY or the same for Christine? And and you know, I I think in some cases we've really let that hold us back because it's been very difficult to prove, you know, which one or one is kind of the secret sauce. And so I, I do think at some point that would be a, a really interesting conversation to spend some time on. Yeah, and you and you remind me, Barb. And sorry, not, this is the last thing I'll say. I promise. But you remind me that the CAQ did issue um, a disclosure framework around this that that was the result of the profession um, coming together, really, and and, and kind of um, discussing um, potential audit quality indicators. Obviously, it's not mandatory, but it's it certainly I think has promoted greater um transparency among among many firms including including ours we certainly look to that framework and then look beyond that framework and what we do but i think that that's an important place to look as well i know we had some other hands up but josh i saw your hand go up when your name was mentioned so i didn't know if you were <laughs> responding to that <laughs> well you know obviously when, when par when barb references you you have to kind of perk up a little bit so um but uh but no, but, but building off of what, what Brian said, I think building off of the CAQ effort from a while back, I think many of us have started incorporating, um, you know, additional metrics into audit committee communications. I think one of the interesting things we found, though, is not every audit committee is created kind of equal and not and everyone and, and audit committees. Um, I don't mean that in terms of their qualifications, but they're in they're in what what metrics resonate with them varies a fair bit um, we found and so there weren't a couple of measures that really I, i'd say resonated consistently across the board where we piloted some audit committees found some certain suites of measures you know really interesting and others found uh, different bits of information very interesting and so it is you know building off of that kind of consistency um it really is um is something that i guess that that um which, which, which I think would be, you know, interesting on a, you know, if the C, if the PCB were to pick up the effort, really, really driving at what does, you know, kind of audit quality mean? What is the kind of from, you know, if the PCB is going to think about it from a profession level. How do they, how do you think about the state of audit quality? What does that mean to an audit committee member? What does that mean, you know, from a firm, from an SQC perspective, and the various usage and the various data points? How do you tie all that together and and make sure you're, you're leveraging data in its most usable way. And so, um, so I just something to, from that perspective as well. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Preeti? Um, I just wanted to, I know we're belaboring the point on audit quality indicators here, um, but I wanted to just add a, a couple points to this. Um, the PCOB's academic fellowship has engaged with a number of um, research projects using their data that have studied in part um, some of the audit quality indicators and show kind of broad based large sample evidence of which things matter and perhaps in certain cases and so forth. So I would just encourage the PCOB to consider leveraging um, that resource as a potential for providing to audit committees. Um, I forgot who mentioned that there, there in 2020, there was a one hour seminar or something given to the audit committees to educate them about that as, as a venue to kind of marry those two ideas is to leverage uh, some of that work that academics have done some that perhaps your staff has done and maybe put it out as webinars to educate uh, audit committees. The alternative approach would be to go through a standard setting process to actually disclose some of these to investors, um, which could have advantages and disadvantages. But I just wanted to lay out these two possibilities um, because I, I really do think this is a huge opportunity that the PCB has already done a lot of work on this and just needs to kind of go the extra step to figure out the best way to communicate it. Thank you. 
Sandy Peters. Um, at the risk of, of, of continuing the um, audit quality indicator conversation, I, I too brought it up at the investor advisory group. Um, and, you know, it, I, I mentioned at the very beginning that I've worked a lot on what's gone on in the UK recently and um, the consultation on European audit quality. Well, it's on corporate reporting, but included in it is, is audit quality. And, you know, the challenge I find is that we, we, we seem to think that audit quality is this elusive concept that we just can't quite, you know, nail down. But we have quality evaluations in every product in vaccines, right? Um, before we inject them in our bodies. And it's really a struggle for investors to see why we can't come up with something um, that's an indicator of audit quality. And as somebody who was an audit partner, you know, I know that there are lots of different factors, um, but this isn't impossible, right? So I guess. My question is, what does it take to move it forward? Certainly, I, I take on board John's point that audit committees are regulated differently than auditors are regulated. And certainly, I think back in the day when this was discussed, we said we'd be fine with starting with audit committees seeing some of these as they get refined. But then investors need to see these because investors, audit is a credence good. And we can't evaluate the quality of audit. I spent a lot of time in the summer of 2019 thinking about this and responding to the Bryden consultation. And it, 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 it seems to me that it shouldn't be that way, right? The, the real challenge with audit is that nobody has all of the information, right? The auditors communicate with the audit committee. The regulator gets to review the work papers. The investors just used to get a blank piece of paper and now get CAMs, which is good, but still we don't get the findings from the CAM, right? We just get that they were a CAM, yeah? Um, and so the, the, the issue is one of why can't we do this, right? Why can't we um, move this along? There, there's, there's some things that we think are necessarily important. Audit is to some people in pricing, they think it's a commodity, right? So how can a commodity be so qualitative and subjective that we can't actually measure it, um, the, the, the quality of it? So I guess I want to put forth that I, I think we need to figure out how we move this forward because I honestly think it's the single most important thing that we need to think about for investors. And, and certainly starting with audit committees and possibly sharing it with investors, but they need more information. Audit committees have very limited information that they share with audit, um, investors. All we get is the opinion. We get just the inspection report. How is the consumer evaluating this? How do we move it beyond a credence good is I guess my appeal, if you will. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. Um, Dane Mott. Sure. J just to tag on to Sandy's comment about it, you know, the the, the bandwagon with the audit quality um, measures, you know, I think the disclosure to both uh, the disclosure and financial reports is important in disclosing to, to markets because that's the power of markets. You know, if people start seeing those disclosures at one company, they're going to look at the disclosures at their competitors and look at what their quality indicators are. And I think over time, it just makes it a more robust system. Um, the information gets circulated and, you know, if there are holes in some of the quality measures that one company has, but others have it, I think that creates like a unifying force that kind of um, elevates them and at least makes other firms, you know, wonder if they should be adopting them. And so, so this is just to kind of emphasize, I think the power of disclosure, why it's important and it, it brings investors into the process. You know, the, the audit is a bit of a black box. The cams are very boilerplate for the most part. And, you know, if we had these quality measures, I think it would um, it give the markets more opportunity to to have dialogue and engagement um, with companies about how they go about these things. Thank you. Oh, last call. I understand that I don't think there are any more hands up. Is that true, no. Jessica? That's true. Okay. Well, 
with that, uh, um, I'd just like to wrap up the meeting and, and thank everyone for the input today. Uh, but I do want to take a moment to thank some of my colleagues who, who I, I can't even explain how hard they work to pull these meetings together in very short order, a much shorter timeline than we used to have when we had advisory groups. And so thank you, Jessica Watts, Danny Verbeck, and Akiko Upchurch uh, from the Office of External Affairs. Thank you, Kent Bonham. Uh, Brandy Boykin, Andrew Gillies, Brian Goodnaw, Will Grofick, and Meredith Mall. And last but not least, thank you, Maya Moselle from ODST for, for making all the technology work today. Uh, we're very lucky to have such a wonderful group of members and, and support staff, and we're really looking forward to working with you. Uh, I hope that you have a happy summer season in the next few months. Stay tuned. Uh, we'll be in touch over the summer. Uh, with future meeting dates or dates, uh, we'll be in touch with some questions. Uh, but please, in the in the meantime, if you have questions, reach out to us. Um, you can get to us through through the SAG administrator, uh, SIAG administrator, uh, email box. Most of you know how to get a hold of Kent or Jessica, and certainly happy to talk at any time. Uh, so with that, thanks again. Um, it's been a historical first meeting, and I can't wait for the next one. Have a great summer, everyone.